Did you see that picture I sent of the last episode? No. The whole camera was like cut off here. Oh, that- so my head was like halfway down. Everyone else looked great. So. <laughs> I watched a little bit. Y'all look fantastic. Oh, thank you. See, there thank we go. Oh, not the last one. Sure, there we go. Not thank the one you. that's uploading. Thank you. No, You're he welcome. hasn't seen it. It's not uploaded oh, no. yet. Oh, <laughs> how close do you have to be with the microphone? That's good. It's okay. Yeah. Just speak to what yeah. says Movo. You'll be fine. Yeah, you'll be a, okay. be a little farther back if you want. It doesn't. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll turn you up. Yeah. Right. Perfect. Um, I can light up. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, let's go ahead and light up. So you I have, have the uh, green Churchill or just the Churchill? Well, the green Churchill. Okay, and the white one. Green. Yeah, they, okay, so there's the green the and the white. white. So that's that's the green the green Churchill. Jared's colorblind, yeah. so. Oh, you're colorblind? Do you need a cutter? Are you actually colorblind? Yeah, actually, yeah. Yeah, it's What does bad. it look like to you? I mean, that looks brown or green to me, but. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> But for, yeah, for a lot of colors, sometimes it is. So you can see green. You can or can't see green. Green and browns are very hard to see. Okay. What color? What about the wrapper tobacco? That obviously looks darker, right? This yeah. looks more green to me than this. No, no, the, okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is. Are you colorblind? This, color is, this or is brown. Not? This is green. I can tell the difference between okay, those. Okay, I got two. you, got you. My question is okay, so that. You don't have an issue telling any difference between like those two colors. Like you know, this is a Connecticut. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I tried that one too. All right, so yeah, the Connecticut. <laughs> all Can white. you answer the question? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just I promise you. <laughs> but, oh, no, I got a buddy okay. of mine that is colorblind. He, he actually sees green as though. orange. He, he sees uh, green as orange. Yeah. 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 Do you need I, a I think color he just, lighter? He can't differentiate different greens, right? <laughs> is that what it is? Yeah. He can't, he can't green, answer a question to... about it, let alone, <laughs> let alone differentiate the yeah. color. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, where did my cigar go? I, I, did I, I just have I, I was trying to figure out. I must have put it back. Jerry, that, Jerry, 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 that's mine. No, you, you, he, you hand me this one. One. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. okay. <laughs> it's been a rough day. Grab case case scenario. Scenario. By the way, smoke as many as you want. I just thought I had one open and cut already. No, I mean, worst case scenario, we'll find the culprit. We have it on video, actually. <laughs> 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 so, how do you guys generally do your show? I, I don't, I don't need any type of script or anything. If no. you need no, to go like, over the top, well, just a few minutes ago, you said you've watched it on our shows. I did watch for a little. I forgot yeah. watch for a little bit of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, we well, just like, like behind the scenes. How do you generally do it? No, we just have a conversation pretty much. Yeah, we'll ask you some questions. Nat- natural as possible. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. No, but I mean, if you need me to ramp up speaking or something, something like that, whatever, or if you do have like a plan kind of rotation that you take with it. No, I'm not cool. really. We just kind of talk, right, cool. ask questions as we're talking. Cool. So did, did you bring a list for us to talk to you about? I didn't bring it. Oh, fuck. We're fucked. <laughs> yeah, I didn't bring it up. Yeah, usually the guest is supposed to bring all the information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got nothing to talk about. You brought the camera though, right? <laughs> well, okay, well, okay, we're good. If there's no pre-approved list of questions, that means we can ask anything. I think. Oh, you guys can ask me. Yeah, if I don't want to answer, I don't answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, by the way, it's cigars. Like, what are you gonna ask? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where, well, well, sometimes they put what? these things in places. You know, it's <laughs> who's they? Jared, Bill Clinton. <laughs> You know, sometimes we go off a little topic. It's not always about cigars. No, I'm down with whatever. I just wanted to, if you guys had an agenda, I'd shut up in certain moments. And, no, yeah. no, no, this no, isn't the mainstream there. media. Cool. Yeah. Gotcha. Anyway, thank you guys for tuning in. Roll the intro. You are tuning in to the Cigar Guys podcast, where aficionados and newcomers alike gather to explore the vast cigar universe. Meet your host, Alexander Gonzalez, Mark Nikolai, his big little brother, Zachary Nikolai, and Jared Burroughs. So sit back, light up, and let's get the conversation started. Okay, so we're back (laughs) with a special guest today, but first, let me go ahead and introduce... The usual suspects, Mark Nikolai. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. How you doing? Good, how are you? Pretty good. Uh, surviving the hurricane. We're here. Nothing crazy yet. Uh, also color matching, crazy uh, coincidence. Jared Burroughs is also here in the studio. You couldn't tell because you're colorblind, but no, me you and Mark, guys are wearing the same no, shirt. No, me and Mark, he, he told me what shirt to wear. Okay. Here. <laughs> well, I, I did not. To be fair, we should have worn a shirt like that. Because that's the cigar of the day, Bentley. We've got John Carney here from Bentley Tobacco. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, guys. There's there's a couple there's a couple funny things 
Are you guys all originally from Florida? Yeah. yeah. Right, so I'm not. I've been here since 2003. <clears throat> but you definitely don't sound like you're from Florida. No, no, I'm from northern Maine. So if you listen closely, you'll uh, you pick up like a little Canadian accent, but it's a northern yeah. accent. It's Canadian. I was a little scared for a yeah. second, but okay. and I just came from a spot like I was in Charleston yesterday, and there's a lot of people from the northeast there that were hanging out. <clears throat> so my accent came out a little bit more. But here in Florida, so I've been talking to my wife all day, and everyone, this hurricane is going to be a pretty good sized hurricane. It's just not going to hit us here in Orlando that hard. And there's going to be flooding and, you know, we're below sea level, whatever. There's nothing Floridians love more than overreacting to any type of weather situation. Now, Tampa, those places, they're about to get it. There's going to be some serious storm surge. The Panhill is going to get pounded. Don't get me wrong. But Central Florida tends to be in a spot where we don't usually get just dumped on. Um, like catastrophically, right? Yeah, we always get grazed. Yeah, yeah. And even you know, last year we took one head on, and it was like a cat three or whatever, and it hit here, and yeah. you know that was you know it was a lot of damage. Don't get me wrong, but it's yeah. nothing like the coast. But too, by the time it gets here, it kind of dissipates. <laughs> yeah, it's all the buildings. Yeah, it was yeah. barely a three, right? But everyone prepares as if it's going to be the worst thing possible, and they prepare with like, hey, we should cook more food. We should <laughs> do this. Do we have enough pizza? Is there enough chicken nuggets? Um, should we get more potatoes to make French Canned fries? Good. Yeah, is there or, or Let's all get a bunch of water. Toilet paper. (laughs) And you end up just not really needing it. And then the people that do need it, you know, you end up donating it back and whatever. But it is funny. There's just this level. And I always tell my wife, because I grew up in, in Maine and we have blizzards all the time. And you just get, you know, you get like three or four feet of snow and you just can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. So it's like the same thing, but frozen. Frozen, yeah. And yeah. probably if it was but raining. But you actually can't leave. Yeah, you actually can't leave. <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as the rain's done, uh, you know, it's over. But it, so it's interesting. So it's been all day. Everybody's been freaking out. And I, I always been like, you know, I'm like, my wife treats every hurricane like it's category eight. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. All my friends are the same way. It's like every hurricane's, oh man, we're going to get hit with this. Let's go do some sand. We're going to, I'm going to sandbag. And there are places that are lower and like mm-hmm. houses yeah, near yeah. me. You know, you know yeah. don't get me wrong, but like people Sanford do. was bad last year. Yeah. 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 But yeah. people do love to take it to another level. Like, you know, if you're in a place, like I know my house, knock on wood. Most likely isn't going to have any flooding issues. I'm probably not going to lose my power, but I do know ten houses down that that person's going to get flooded because they're four feet lower than me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, you know, I get it, but people do, you know, react as if it's, you know, oh my gosh, we're going to be ready for this, and I'm like. I think it's going to be all right, and I just don't overreact. Yeah. Well, it's like it's every year, and you've lived here for 10, 20 years, whatever it is. Yeah. Like, you should know what to expect. But were you here during Charlie? Oh, yeah. I think everybody thinks of that when they want to prepare. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That or like you Katrina. Know. Uh, dude, I didn't even lose. I didn't lose power during that, during Charlie. Really? When no. was that? that? Oh, we were kids. I was yeah, like, I was two, what was it, like 2006 or seven? Yeah, Six, something like maybe that, yeah. Five, maybe five. Yeah, uh, we got by Charlie another one, and then I think Charlie circled back around or something like that. We got two back to back. Yeah, um, who, who was Katrina? Two thousand four. That Katrina? was a little earlier, I think. Yeah, yeah might have been earlier than that because you came here in two thousand three. But wasn't Katrina up in the Panhandle? That was yeah, more like Louisiana. Yeah, Louisiana, uh, Louisiana yeah, yeah. yeah. So Charlie was. So I was here in three. Charlie was four or five. Uh, I think it might have been two thousand four or five because I wasn't. I would have been a sophomore in college, so I think it was then. But I lived over in Windermere area, and the the all the power lines were were buried. We didn't lose power. Yeah, at all. The underground. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, but it did. I mean, it was. We were fortunate to have to be in an area. It didn't. Um, but you know, definitely interesting stuff. So yeah, we are. We're. Uh, we're. This is technically hurricane party right now. I guess so. Yeah. It off. Yeah. I've been trying to have one for the last few years. There and we it, go. You got it. Yeah. I guess I finally. Thank you got for one. Uh, helping us kick it off. So we yeah. have plenty of cigars, plenty of great cigars too. Uh, we're going to talk about this podcast. So go ahead and you know, first of all, talk a little bit more about yourself and your story getting into cigars into the industry and stuff like that. Well, first of all, I should have made you guys feel bad and not told you that I live. I know you guys know we've seen each other around uh, town here, some of the cigar bars, but. I should have said I don't live here and I flew in just specifically for this. <laughs> <laughs> I have to get out of town immediately after. He would have uh, been so happy. Hurricane. He'd have been like, exactly. This is what the guests need to do. <laughs> yeah. This, this is the extra. He's like, there's a decorum that needs to be followed here. Uh, no, I thought it'd be even cooler that you took the time out of your personal time just to fly down to see us. That's how I would. <laughs> Technically, I did do that. It's just I'm yeah. not flying back to wherever I have to after. <laughs> I, I will tell you, though, I was talking to my dad on the way over to his head and talked to him for a couple 
couple of days. And um, I was like, hey, I'm doing a podcast. Uh, I got a podcast. He watches me do different podcasts. And uh, he's like, oh, you dialing in? I said, actually, I'm really fired up for this one. Not that I'm not for the others. But there is a level of quality that comes with in person, mm-hmm. the right sound systems. Um, you know, I, I, I was part of a podcast that I started with a friend of mine uh, during COVID and I, I dialed into his show last week and I'm sitting on my back porch. It's fine, but I'm on my headset sitting on my back porch. It does make a big difference in the in person yeah, stuff. Yeah. And I appreciate yeah, when I uh, doing these things and, you know, uh, hopefully I can be on more since we do live close. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. But I do understand it's challenging for people to get in. But when you're able to do it, it does make a major difference. Yeah. Um, because you can't, all of us don't have a studio at home, uh, set up like this. I should, honestly, because it's not crazy to do it, but you know, there's a big difference of in person. Yeah. And, and that really is a nice thing. So I'm glad I could fly in today and then do this with you guys. And hopefully I don't get stuck and can get back to the, uh, to winter should park be good from here. Now. Yeah. Private knock plane. on wood. But no, <laughs> and, and yeah, you're absolutely right though. People don't, a lot of people don't understand. The different level of, you know, first of all, in person is a lot easier, but the quality of the equipment you're using, you know, if you plug in your AirPods, sometimes that's fine, but sometimes people got like the 10 year old. Well, the conversation is just naturally better too. Like, too if, yeah. if you know yeah. I'm about to interrupt what you're saying, you like stop talking, you stop talking naturally and vice yeah. versa. Whereas I'll yeah, watch a latency or delay. Yeah. When you're, when you're on the headset, it's like, all right. There could be one second of delay and then it just creates a real awkward exchange where, you know, sitting in person is a great thing. So no, I'm glad to be here. It's yeah, excellent. Good. And, um, and, uh, yeah, that's the way I get around from answering, not answering your question. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, we, got Kamala yeah, nice. we got Kamala Harris in the studio. Uh, the, <laughs> the day is today. And because it's yeah, yeah. today, we must know that today is today. Well, he started off, to answer your question, he started off, he grew up in a middle class family. That, that I, was did. Very profound. <laughs> I did. Very <laughs> I did. Um, so no, I, I, uh, so I started in, I, I might have be very similar stories to how you guys got into cigars because you were, you're all from the area here, right? So I, I went to UCF for undergrad and grad school. So I moved down here in 2003 from Maine. And, uh, I wanted to be an athlete in college and I, but I didn't, I, that's what I thought my goal was going to be. I either wanted to be a professional athlete or the CEO of Walt Disney World or a casino owner. Those are my three goals in life. Yeah. Uh, so I think ath- professional athlete was the most <laughs> likely to happen. So <laughs> athlete, yeah, which is funny. So athlete was what I was like, what I was focused on the most. And then out of high school, uh, basketball was my sport. And I wasn't, I, I was, I was a very good athlete at everything. Basketball was the one I was the most passionate about, but football was the one that I had the most exposure with in terms of what the next level wanted. And I wasn't really excited about doing that, um, putting in that type of effort. They wanted to transform my body. I mean, I was 195 pounds. They wanted, I looked like I played football now, but, um, you know, they wanted to really transfer for, for me in the weight room. And I, I wasn't quite sure. And I loved basketball. So I was like, I don't know if I, have that passion for football in terms of continuing on. So anyway, long story short, I moved down here and uh, ended up going to UCF for college. And I uh, was here from 03 to 07 and then did grad school um, until 2011. And how I got started in cigars, which is a very <coughs> common story here in Central Florida, is because we're, uh, for those that know, know, but I think a lot of people know, uh, the largest individual cigar retailer privately owned in the entire world is here. It's named Corona Cigars. Um, I won't give away the location, but it's right. There. We've said it. It's like <laughs> right across it, yeah. the street. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> and uh, you are right, though. That's basically the origin yeah, of where yeah. we started. So. so I was in, I did the, the Rosen College of Hospitality Management, which is on the mm-hmm. this west side of town, right? And it's a small campus. Coincidentally, it's like a high school kind of in terms of total enrollment. It's like 2,500 students, right? But my high school had like 300. So that for me was huge. Yeah. Um, but even UCF being the second largest school in the country was massive. It's great that we're here because I'm like with my hands in the screen. I'm, <laughs> I'm literally pointing in the direction that these places are. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started in... In my uh, freshman year of college, we started smoking flavored cigars. My buddy, uh, my buddy was pretty well off, so his family go on vacation. They'd come back and bring Cuban cigars, and uh, we started smoking CAO flavors. And then we're like, "Wait a minute!" We're like, "This is this place called Corona," and they had just opened, I think, a year or two prior the Sand Lake location because mm-hmm. he was over in um, Mokoi before. Uh, and doing mail order and doing yeah. great, yeah. but it was a little hole in the wall place. And then 
the Superstore opened up and it became the ultimate cigar experience. And I think in 2006, they opened up the downtown location and the rest was history. So we'd go there in between classes yeah. um, and go smoke cigars. And they used to sell Cuban sandwiches back in the day there. So we'd go have coffee. It's just what we needed. We're 21, 22 years old. We need a bunch of caffeine, uh, Cuban sandwiches, a bunch of cigars. Mm-hmm. Let's go over there. It was a blast. So we... And they had everything. So you could, anything you were interested in seeing, uh, you, you didn't need to go anywhere else. It really, you know, became the ultimate cigar experience. So that's how I got into it. And then I, uh, I worked for Darden restaurants here for three years as a manager for mm. them. And I also worked for Disney for three years. Disney was actually my longest job before, uh, I was with LFD. Um, so I worked at Disney, did the universal thing for a bit. And I was a cabana boy there, but we always smoked cigars. It was always a passion. And then in 2011, there's some fun stuff that happened in between them that led into me doing that. And that can, we'll talk about that if it comes up in questions, but so uh, happened 2011. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, in 2011, in 2011 was when I started with LFD. So I worked nice. part time at this little shop. It was called Havana Sensation. Um, and the owner of the company, Lito's son, uh, Tony was a sales rep. He just graduated from, uh, from FSU. And, uh, I ended up taking a job as a sales rep for them up in the Northeast. So I did New England and New York for about a year and a half. And then I was promoted to the vice president of sales for them in 2013 and, uh, and left that position in July of this year, July 1st. And, um, I was with them for about 14 years. So 14 of the 30 years I were in business, uh, made quite a reputation, traveled the whole country. Um, yeah. I, you know, 180 flights a year, 290 hotel nights, uh, all over the place. Um, so that's what led to, to me being into cigars. And then what led me into Bentley was when I left LFD and I'll pause after this so we can take a drink of water. <laughs> and by we, I mean me. Um, I was looking at making my own brand. I had this three phase project, but I'm still doing the three phase, uh, phase project. We're in, we're about to be in phase two next week. Um, and phase one was making a brand. And I was like, okay, what do I do with this? Uh, how do I fund it? Um, I know I can, I know with my background in cigars, I can make a great cigar. I have great relationships with really good manufacturers. I was no concerned about that, but it was, the funding was the first thing. And then what do I do if I do make a great cigar? How do I make the brand? And, the my partners in Bentley here in the USA uh, had been in business for about 112 years and they came along with this brand named Bentley and I'm like no matter what I do I go I can't name something Bentley um they've already done a ton of the legwork as we'll get into and I don't have to spend any money to do it so I was like let me try the cigar so we smoked it asked where it came from Hoyt in Nicaragua Nicaragua's oldest cigar factory and uh tons of respect for that company um and their manufacturing and i was like this is a no-brainer it came up at the right time that i needed it and uh and that's how it was born and that's why we're that's where we got to today so that's the cliff notes nice Nice. it's pretty cool Mm -hmm. because like originally we actually had an interview scheduled when you were with lfd and then this whole thing happened you kind of left lfd and it was like all right what's going on and i think people that follow you Started to see that, you know, you were posting a lot of Bentley cigars. So maybe something new was coming. And then sure enough, you made the official announcement and you had joined up with Bentley cigars. And here we are now. So it didn't, it was not in the plans when, when I left on July 1st. So it all happened just really quickly. So I had two weeks, um, that I was completely incognito. So my old, my old phone number. Was, uh, wasn't my phone number. I had it for 14 years, but it was their number. Um, so they, they mm-hmm. took, they got the phone number. Um, so I've got a new phone and people are reaching out to me. I'm sure when that phone gets turned on, it's going to be a freaking barrage. And I, I, there'll probably be a lot of funny things sent in there too. I mean, I was there for 14 and a half years. We, you know, publicly left on very good terms. Um, but I'm sure there's going to be some stuff in there that'll be pretty freaking funny. Um, and I would love to have the opportunity to, to look at that, but I didn't turn it on before I sent it back. But, but fine. Um, so nobody really had access to me other than social media, mm. which was fine because there was a lot of people that have access. But I, I, I controlled the dialogue of when I left. So I said, and I'm going into doing this consulting thing called Shoulders of Giants. 
uh, which is there. It was a thing I started with my dad and it was part of every press release on, of how I left. And it was a pretty mm. hot story. I was, it was bigger than I thought it was going to be. Um, you know, I'm confident in what I do, but I'm humble to an extent. I do have, you know, I have confidence in what I'm doing. It's not cocky if it, if you can back it up. Um, I don't brag about myself, but you know, I worked for 14 years and I was the vice president of a very reputable cigar brand worldwide. Uh, so it got a lot of traction. So I was sitting there, I was like, you know, let me control the dialogue here, give people heads up. I kind of want to be left alone to figure out what's next, but I had some ideas of, of different things. Uh, but no, it what this had, I had nothing done. Hmm. If, if I'd had this in the works, I would have probably said nothing mm -hmm. for till August 30th when the day that we announced it, you know, I started posting some pictures and yeah. things, but I would have said nothing. Um, so there, no, there was nothing in the works. I threw everything out there that I possibly had and see if it stuck on the wall. The problem was everything stuck. So now I'm kind of working <laughs> on focusing it back. So I have yeah. some clients that have like I pitched on some things here that are now coming back and like, Hey, you know, I need that website work. I need this social media work and we're going to do it. Uh, but it was like, yeah, you know, I can't do that anymore because now I have this. Uh, so it wasn't part of the plan. Uh, we connected up about two weeks after and it was through a, a very close friend in the industry that's very uh, well known and reputable and had been a great friend of mine. And, uh, I, he's going to remain silent. Uh, you know, I'll, uh, he's a secret forever. Uh, but he really helped me out and it was great. And then he introduced me to these people and I had known them for 15 years because they'd sold LFD for us, uh, in Europe uh, mm. prior to that. So I had a relationship with them. So, yeah, no, it happened pretty quickly, uh, shortly after. And then we yeah. just started you know, building the back end of it. Yeah. So these cigars were already made at this point, obviously. They, so how long was the brand around before you joined up with them? So the Bentley brand itself uh, was born in 1970. Oh, wow. It was a pipe uh, pipe company. Um, the pipe maker, his name was Hans Nielsen. He went by, his nickname was Former. So people that are big pipe smokers, this guy was like one of the one or two guys that was like a legend making pipes in the 70s. He was making four and 5,000 euro pipes uh, in the 70s. And the Bentley pipe brand was born in 1970. So fast forward a bit in the early 2000s, they wanted to start doing a different, they started distributing a little bit differently and they also wanted to make a pipe tobacco company. So they went to this company called uh, August Schuster, who is the family that now owns the brand now, the Schuster family. And they've been in business for over a century too. So they made pipe tobaccos mm -hmm. and they made cigarillos. Um, they dabbled in cigarettes for a period of time, but they were a tobacco company in, in Germany. So they, they started working with them and making pipes with them pipe tobacco for them. They made a brand of pipe tobacco called Bentley Pipe Tobacco, which still exists today in part of the Bentley brand. And through bad circumstances, the owner of this company, which was called like Brew Boo, um, died in a car accident mm. and he had no family left mm. Damn. and nobody was involved in the company and they weren't quite sure what they're doing. So the Schusters were like, we're already making pipe tobacco for them. We're involved in some distribution agreements. And that brand Bentley is a pretty cool thing to own. So they were like, Let, let's continue on doing this and bring it underneath because it may, makes sense with what we're doing because they were in that space anyway. Um, they brought that brand in and continued on. And in 2011 and 12, the premium side of it started coming in outside of pipes and pipe tobacco, which is premium as well. But premium cigar side started coming and they came out with the green line um, and then the white line. And it really took off in 2017 in Europe is when they mm. really launched it there. And they did do a little small launch here last year in 2023. They did like a little tour with a company that they distribute some products for um, in uh, in Europe, CLE, Christian Aroa's family. Um, they distribute the products here in the U.S. for them in terms of shipping. So they handle the shipping for us, which was a great thing, too, because they're like, who's shipping for you? And they're like, Christian, I'm like, perfect. Mm -hmm. um, they have a, they have real systems in place. They have real ways of handling the accounting sides of it. I go, so that's, you know, something we don't have to worry about. We can really go out and launch the brand. So they did have it here, but it was, you know, it was probably five or six retailers. They just yeah. didn't have the bandwidth. They they had everything done right. They just needed somebody to light a fire and keep it going. And that's what I that's what I professionally do. So, yeah. Um, so it was. This brand has been, you know, you're looking at a brand that started in the 1970s, which the pipe side of it actually, the Brew Boo Company, they, they've been around since 1878. Oh, wow. So you've got yeah. two families that have been around for over a century. There's a lot of history for sure. Tons. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm just like, this is a great story. I just need somebody to tell it. Then they 
coincidentally teamed up with the oldest Nicaraguan cigar factory. So I was like, like, you guys just keep adding to the story. I'm like, I, 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 how would I even create anything close to that? And like the cigar wise, I could create the cigar, but that story is like, you know, one day John Carney decided he wanted to make a cigar brand. So he did, uh, you know, that's, <laughs> that, that's my, that would have been my story, and I, you know, telling different things that I've done, but they really built something great. And it made sense for me to, to jump on that. And, um, we were just like-minded. We we're on the same page of what they needed and what they wanted to do. And how the timing was, was really perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I think the point that I was getting at is I think in the States for sure, this was basically a brand that's not really known as far mm-hmm. as the cigars are concerned until very recently where you and more, you and a few other people started promoting it. Now we know Bentley cigars here in the States. And I see, you know, it's been a few weeks, maybe a month or so. It's been three weeks. Yeah. Three weeks. Now we're seeing some traction. Yeah. Other and retailers across the country. Mm-hmm. So good traction for three weeks for sure. And obviously you knowing all these people have been in the industry for, you know, almost 15 years or so. It's incredible traction because I, yeah. I haven't solicited anybody. Um, the retailers that we're working with have all reached out to us and it's uh, by us. I mean, me, it's a one person show here uh, right now and we will expand. So it's been really good. And we've had, you know, we've had reorders, People say, oh, you can sell everything once, you know, the second, third time is challenging. Yeah, it is. But one can be super challenging because you just got to get it in. Um, so, you know, I, I, they came here in 2023. I was traveling the whole United States. I didn't see the brand. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for all intents and purposes, they were in great, re- they did have some really good retailers that brought it in. It just didn't have a focus. There was nothing behind it. It was like, hey, it's on our, you know, we have it at our store. We have it here. Uh, but it needs to be. You know, the machine has to be operating. You have to have all pieces of it and somebody's got to be a face of it. Um, the brand's got to represent itself and then it's got to do, you know, it's got, it's got to have the right inside part. The cigar's got to be good too, but they just did everything and all they were missing was, was, was a me. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think there's one me. There's people that are very similar that can do similar things with other companies, but they're not available. Um, and the, the randomness of me coming available on July 1st after you sit and listen. In every industry, right? I listen to podcasts and it's hard to find good people. Or you go on time, it's hard to find good people or people that are, dude, I was there for 14 and a half years. It's a long time. Like that doesn't exist. Uh, you know, and we had, that was the thing we talked about it was like, you know, the fact we're having this is a unique, having this conversation because there's literally people, like I sit there, I'm hiring people and be like, ah, nobody's loyal. Nobody wants to work. I, you know, it's hard to get people to be around for that period of time. Then you have the experience of what they're doing internally uh you know so that's a very random circumstance Mm -hmm. um and that's why it happened pretty quickly because i was like you know this is the the sake where they uh the opportunity we have to even just have this discussion without me being employed by somebody is a pretty unique situation Mm -hmm. so it uh, worked out really well yeah you're absolutely right though too especially in this industry having the person the rep usually for a certain company is what makes or breaks a cigar company a lot of times. I mean, this is a very old school industry and a lot of these shops prefer companies that show a face regularly. And it's so important in this business because it's smaller now, right? So it's smaller than most businesses that, that are out there. You know, it, you don't have like a Ronald McDonald type. You have to have a real figure that these people can connect with, especially with social media. I mean, I have people that that reached out and that are doing part of our initial retail launch, which is a small group. We're really doing about 40 to 50 max, uh, just based off availability. And we'll, we'll grow a little more before the end of the year. And then next year we'll get real aggressive. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're still not going to overgrow. We're looking at a small group of retailers, uh, you know, so we can service them appropriately and, and dig out a niche in this market. That's it. That's there, but most companies aren't doing because their egos, they want to be in a thousand accounts. Um, or they just want to scale. It. I'd rather work with two to three hundred than a thousand and do similar amounts of revenue. That's better for them. That's better for me. It's but everyone's a win. Um, but the the connection with it, I got people that didn't do business really business with me when I was with LFD. Them like, hey, I like this. Let's do this. I'm like, okay. Yeah. I had you know the, I was up yesterday in Charleston and um, this place called Cigars on Maybank and Cigars on Seventeen. A good friend of mine, Dan, he never carried LFD in the store, uh, but he's like, I told myself I wasn't bringing in any more shiny new toys. He's like, you know, the business is flat right now. We're not sure what's going on with the election. We're probably in a recession. He's like, but I like your shiny new toys. Like, I have to do it. <laughs> and I was like, you're not going to be disappointed. And he's like, I know I'm not. 
Um, so it's been nice to, to see people receptive to that. Um, I fortunately worked with a great company that we, we really protected the pricing of it. So it really supported the brick and mortar retailers. And, and it's, uh, I said it was having 15 years. Cause I had somebody ask me like, how do you avoid being in wholesalers? And I was like, I just won't sell to them. Mm-hmm. You know, like I don't, if we can't yeah. be in a place, if there's a stock, if there's a retailer or a cigar bar or a high end club that wants our product and we can't get into it, uh, we've done something wrong. Cause we can do business with people that have the proper licenses. They probably don't have a proper license or find a way to work with it. Uh, but it's like, no, we can get these to places that, you know, you can't get to. It was like, I don't want to be in places that we can't get to, that we want to grow with those retailers. We want to work with those partners that way. And I said, it's that simple. It's just, uh, how do you avoid it? I know who they are. I'm just, you know, I'm going to tell them straight up. Sorry, we're not wholesaling the product to be distributed to, you know, convenience stores or, or places that we don't know. Um, so it's, it's a really cool, cool opportunity. It's fun to start something from zero. And the best part about it was, is we started at zero. So it was like August 30th is when we announced it, right? So just a, almost a month. So three and a half weeks. The very next day we had cigars to sell because it was in inventory. It was in stock and ready to go. So like if I had done my own brand, it would have been, I would have had cigars yeah, for six be months. Like next year. Yeah. yeah so yeah. it was kind of, it was the great thing that just happened to be good cigars too, which was great. Yeah. How many shops did they, were they in before you hopped on? I honestly can't remember. I think it was like eight. It might have okay. been nine. I, uh, out of the group, there was some that were really good. Um, and I did tell them, uh, my partners, uh, the shoes, I said, one thing I'm going to tell you guys is, um, some of these people that bought it, I might not sell to them. Um, just because there's some other places that we may want to launch it. Um, I go, but I will reach out to all of them and say, Hey, this is what we're doing. Do you want to still be a part of it? Or do you have product? Cause again, there was no real push with it. It was just, Hey, you have it. And they had to do it on their own. Um, so I did give them the right, you know, I give them the first right of refusal and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm chasing them around to make sure that I can talk to them too. If I can't get hold of them, I want to give them every right to have first right of refusal on it because they did bring it in. I, you know, just because we didn't have what we have right now, then doesn't mean, you know, you were loyal, you kept it, you didn't discount it. Um, so let's try to make this work and, and we will, but, uh, you know, some of them won't, you know, some of them won't make sense. Uh, they gave it a shot. It didn't work. And, and, I, I think they'll be disappointed if they don't, because what, what got this to work in the first three and a half weeks was the 15 years of work that I put in. Mm-hmm. And I've done a little bit of traveling, um, with it, you know, with some few things, but I haven't done anywhere near what I'm going to do. And yeah. with that traveling I've been doing is basically going in and saying, hello, re, uh, you know, re, uh, rehashing yeah. what we're going to do. And we did like a little private event last night, but I mean, really what made this work is that like I go out and did crazy experiences. Like yeah. we'd go out and do like gold steak dinners. We go out and do great cigar pairings. Um, you know, I sit, we talk, we become friends, uh, you know, and then we stay in touch on social media. So I was like, what built this and got this great start is all of that effort. And that's what's going to hit next yeah. year. I go, then we're going to see real impact. So I think people are going to be disappointed if they didn't give it a shot. And since it's going to be a small group of people, there might be somebody nearby you that that's jumped on board and, you know, Hey, you, you didn't think it was going to make sense. And fine. I respect that there's plenty of cigars out there, but, um, the, the train might have gone down the road at that point in time because we are not going to open up thousands of accounts with this. And that's mm. not the goal. Yeah. Well, too, uh, if you have a great yeah. product, number one, you don't want to have, you, you don't have to stress about getting certain people. If it doesn't work out with certain retailers, that's okay. You've got hundreds of other ones that are going to work out just fine. Mm-hmm. Um, and two, what you bring to the company is your 15 years of worth of contacts and people that like you and respect you as a person. So you just go in there and say, Hey, this is the new project we're working on. And that's a huge reason yeah. for them to be like, yeah, let's do it. I greatly underestimated that. Um, because I was trying to figure out what was next, right? So it's um, so you know you're you're at a lower point, being like, hey, what's next? What do I do? What am I? What do I want to do? I know I want to do my own thing, but what do I do? And then people just latched on, and it was awesome. It was super humbling. Uh, it was it was really comforting at the same time, and and knowing that it's going to continue on, where people are, hey, we're bringing this in because we know what we're going to do together, uh, and then the brand looks great too. And by the way, the cigars are good, so it's like. You just did everything right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. you know, yeah. It worked out good. Um, so there are, it's funny because I, I'm, I'm trying, there's people that I'm, I'm close with a ton of people in this business. I'm probably close enough with four to 500 retailers 
where if I did solicit them, they would, you know, we would be considering bringing it in quite heavily. They'd be like, you know, 50, 60% of the way minimum. So I know there's some people out there that I haven't reached out to that I'm friends with. And I've texted some. I've been like, hey, I'm not ignoring you. I just, I, like, I mean, we're in 45 retailers right now. Nobody's solicited, but I'm keeping you in mind. Like, yeah. I haven't dropped it around anybody that's in an area like that yet. But I do know there's some people like, well, why hasn't John called me yet? Or, you know, hey, I wonder what's going on. And I had some people that have reached out and been like, hey, I was wondering why you hadn't reached out. I was like, cause I'm trying not to sell out what we have in stock cause I don't get a refill till November. And part of what I'm trying to do is part of our, uh, part of my brand promise is we're not going to grow at the expense of existing retailers. It would be really tough if I opened up some of these people and I, and I told them like, you're going to get your time. And it's just, I haven't called because I, yeah. I can't, I can't go against that. And they're like, no, we appreciate it. It's no problem. It's just, honestly, it's giving me a chance to figure out where we'd put it anyway. Yeah. Cause two, nothing's worse yeah. than you saying, let's do it. And then, Hey, it's going to be like two months from now. Yeah. It's back ordered. Yeah. 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 You know, and I worked for a company that had heavy, heavy demand and uh, supply chain concerns. Um, but that was a big reputable brand around for 30 years. People yeah. will wait for that if they smoke that cigar for 30 years. And they saw it after that brand too. That yeah. Was yeah. That big and, of a brand. And that's challenge, you know, it creates challenges. But with a smaller brand, if you, if you go through it and I can't resend it to you, then it's dead. Yeah. Um, you know, the people that have reordered already, I've had a few, uh, there's going to be more reorders next week. But the fact they had it and they said, Oh, is it in stock? Yes. Oh, great. You know, so you're not losing traction on yeah. it. It's building up and we're doing it in the last quarter of the year, which is a challenging part of the year to, to do it in because everything kind of ramps down a little bit. But we're said so we're, we're doing it in a little niche market. We're a shiny new toy with a really great brand recognition, uh, at a, at a time where, you know, a lot of the retailers that are capturing it's causing some excitement for them. So let's talk about the cigars too. We've got two different blends and. Uh, how many different sizes? Three? So, four. So our offerings here to, uh, Bentley Tobacco USA are, we have the green line, uh, so Bentley green and Bentley white. The Bentley white's a Ecuadorian Connecticut shade. And then we've got the Bentley green, which is a Habano Rosado. Rosado is a color rating. It's like a reddish brown tint. Um, and they're both medium bodied blends. Um, the Connecticut tends to have a little more creaminess to it. The green tends to have a little more earthiness, but they are more medium bodied. Um, and they're really blended. I, this is a funny thing that I say. It doesn't really mean anything, but, uh, people are like, no, this is a little different. And I'm like, yeah, it's blended for the European palate. <laughs> and they're like, it, it is different because they mm. smoke Cuban cigars a lot, which are more medium. Uh, people say, oh, they're strong. If they say, if somebody's telling you Cuban strong, it's because it's under fermented and it's just pungent or you know, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, a, a, a real good Cuban cigar is not strong. It's real clean. We've had the conversations palate. like that before. Where we're like, look, uh, Cuban cigars are usually mild to medium. Yeah, like, good you ones. Know, yeah. yeah, they should be. That's, that's what it should be. That's the tobacco they have. So if it's strong, there's something going on there. Yeah. Uh, but it is. I mean, the European market does smoke a little milder. It's getting fuller bodied now that you have more of the new, uh, you know, like new world or U.S. brands over there. Uh, but these, these are, but it's funny. I do say it. I was thinking about it on the plane. I'm like, that's a blended for the European palate. <laughs> uh, but it is different. And, and it honestly, it's great because especially for Nicaraguan tobacco, the last 15 years or uh, 10, 15 years or so, Nicaragua has become huge, right? Yeah. Um, it's the largest premium cigar. Uh, create, uh, you know, manufacturing country in the world. And it was really based off of like front palate spice ass kickers. Um, so when this comes out, it's like, this is smooth, well fermented aged Nicaraguan tobaccos, you know, two to three year old tobaccos in it. When you age it that long, it does get a little mellower. Um, it's just the market has been driven so much by that front palate spice and it's slowly coming back yeah. away from that now. And, but this, so this is a little out there from uh what people are used to smoking which is good yeah and then we had a conversation about that too i told you when i first smoked this connecticut i said it reminds me of a really good cuban cigar mm -hmm. like some of the older ones that have been sitting in the shops for a while um so i do definitely get that european profile as you would describe yeah. it yeah I i'm gonna continue to describe it and I, I, it's only 40% ridiculous when I say it. It's 60% real. It, it really is, but it, I did find, and when I've said it now I'll a few times, I'll say it's that. hilarious. The European palette. But, uh, it's four sizes available right now. So we have the Corona, Robusto, Toros, and, uh, Churchill. And the Churchill is not a true Churchill. It's a seven by 54. So it's a little bit bigger ring gauge than a traditional Churchill, which is nice because that's going to be good in the market here. Uh, we do have, 
several other facings that are available in Europe. We coincidentally have a seven by 70. Okay. Uh, that's not going to come over here quite yet. Um, there's a half Corona, a Bellicoso. So there's about seven to eight different sizes in each line, but we want to keep it simple initially. We also have, um, five packs. Uh, we've got these nice, beautiful cardboard five packs uh, that will be coming in 2025, but those are available in Europe. And then we have a third line called B13, uh, which is the B separated. It's a one and a three. Mm. Um, and that has three, uh, three normal Vitolas in it. And then it has several cigarillo sizes. Uh, it has a cigarillo tins, uh, which is really nice. And then we have pipes and pipe tobacco. So it's a full line of products. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but if we were to bring it in all at once, it'd be, uh, it'd be overloaded. Hey, I need you to spend $20,000 to bring this in. Well, it's brand new. Uh, <laughs> not going to happen. It'd be really challenging. As you said, we want the lines to be identifiable with simple branding with colors, green and white. Uh, Bentley is a brand name that's uh, very recognizable. Um, any, it's two syllables, Bentley, which is really nice. And it's everyone that speaks a, any language in the world knows that that says Bentley. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's, there's a lot of things that are done right about it. So we need to do those things and continue to, it continues to work through how the brand works. So like the rollout's going to be simple. Uh, when we add the things next year, we're going to add the five packs. We're going to add the half Corona in the five packs instead of in boxes, uh, cause that, that does better. And that's, that size cigar sells very well in five packs. Um, and then we will look at some of the pipe tobacco companies. Um, there's a limited edition product that, that I'm working on that might fall underneath the Bentley, uh, label as well. Um, we're, we're, we're going to find out tomorrow okay. if that's going to fall under the Bentley label, but Good we'll luck. talk about it a little bit because the press release is coming out next week, but I had no issue talking about it because it's live. Um, and yeah, then, this, this is going to be uh, next week. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Well, yeah. So, yeah. So it may be out by then. Uh, but the um, the B thirteen will come probably after that, maybe in twenty twenty six. But so there's expand. It's expandable without you know reinventing the wheel because yeah. it's. I said it's something that's working, so we can slowly bring things in. And our retail partners will be part of it. They'll know what's coming. So it's like, hey, you know, the ne- next thing we're doing is the five packs. Uh, we got the short Corona coming, and we got this LE product. Um, then if you're a pipe purveyor in the group and let's look at the pipes, see which ones you help us pick, which ones work the best, the pipe, the pipe tobaccos that you want, and we'll bring those in. So it's really, it's really a straightforward and transparent whole, everything about it is very transparent for the consumer, for the retailer. And I like to think if there's not a lot of smoke and mirrors going on, Mm -hmm. um, It'll be receptive to people, and I know the retailer is going to get behind it that way, and the consumer, I I believe, is going to follow as well. Yeah. What it sounds like to me is this is a very already established brand in terms of product. You have all these products that are ready to go. All it takes now is just the slow rollout. I would say like the appropriate rollout to bring it into a whole new market, i.e. the States. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no reason to be greedy about it, right? Like, if, if I go and put 30 SKUs out there, you got to find places to put 30 SKUs. Yeah. Um, that's not fair to anybody. Um, it's not fair to you as a consumer. Like, how it's do not. you grow with a brand if I get to try 30 things yeah. first? Like, you got yeah. two things to try. Um, all right, great. Perfect. All right. And then I'll try them more often because it's easy for me to identify which ones I like. I'll smoke the yeah. different sizes. And two, it's like, okay, I like this brand. And then all of a sudden, hey, breaking news, there's a new product coming. It's like, okay, I already know this is a great brand. People are now excited to try your next release. Yeah. And, and so you you have like a niche part of the cigar market where, where it's like us, we're cigar geeks or, or cigar guys. Cigar okay, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or cigar guys. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you. <laughs> Uh, mm-hmm. so we, you know, we try other things, but there are things that become part of a re- regular repertoire, which is this will be something like that then we will do fun things. Uh, but keeping it less confusing is the way to go. There's cigar brands. I, I could name them by name. I'm not, it's not my MO anymore. Um, internally I is, but this stuff, this, this brands that I smoke, I have no clue what they're called. I, yeah. I'm familiar yeah. with the company and I know the name of the brand, but I don't know what the sizes are. I look at his 50 sizes. Like, what does that mean? And then they got 30 or 40 limited edition stuff, which is great because that builds up over a period of time. Right. But I'm like, it's just super confusing. It's kind of overwhelming, right? It's violently yeah. overwhelming. And if you overwhelm a consumer, they're either going to just keep buying because they can and they want to have what's next with it, or they're going to buy a little bit less of it and then buy something that they're less overwhelmed buying because this is relaxation if i have to overthink 
relaxing, I'm not going to do that a whole lot. And if that's based off of there's just too much of it, uh, there's, you know, everything looks the same and then there's a billion different sizes and I don't know what's going on with it. You know, it, yeah, you get overwhelmed by the, you know, attrition naturally it'll get smoked, but I, I think that's where this comes in and us doing it that way can make it less confusing, make it easier for people to be a part of it. And then the whole process as we bring things out that fits into what is all right. Now I know what Bentley green, I know Bentley white. And this new size sounds great. And then this new limited edition is going to work really great for me. Um, that's something I want to participate in. And maybe, you know, maybe I like that. Now I'm into pipes. Who knows? Uh, if you, but it's all simple. You know, if you ever want us to like, you know, test things out before you release, <laughs> you let me know. I, I've, I've heard I've got samples coming soon of the project, uh, that we're doing. And, um, the uh, project's uh, it's, it's like a, not a crowdsource thing, but it's going to open. It's called the AI Cigar Project, and it's going to allow okay. anyone on the planet. I love the name already. Yeah, yeah. to Dude, come in right and now. put put input <laughs> in. It's live right now, so you guys will be able to do this. Uh, we could do it oh, right now if you wanted. Um, so you can go and do the questionnaire, and based off how you answer questions, that you get different questions, and we get data from it. Um, now we're not going to use AI to make the cigar. We're just using AI mm-hmm. to collect the data, and yeah. then we're using it to mm-hmm. uh, yeah. to uh, bring the data together. So then we can go work with, you know, master blenders and great factories to make something really special. Um, so that process is underway, but we're getting some samples going, uh, just to have some stuff to try and see what we think. Cause we, we've had, we've had people that have done it. It's on the website. So people have naturally run into it and they're like, Hey, what's this? And they do the survey. Mm-hmm. So we start to have a little bit of a trend. Now where our goal is to have hundreds or thousands of people do it but most likely we're i have like seven different samples coming of three different styles and pretty much it's going to fall and i kind of have an idea where it's going to go and you know we'll just make some tweaks so then we're on the same page so um i kind of know what direction it's going to go so we are doing some initial sampling on it and then we'll finalize what we do that once we get the data collected very very nice yeah and i mean too it hasn't been mentioned but Bentley itself is a very recognizable name, hence the luxury car brand. And we actually we saw one outside. Yeah, yeah. The first, yeah there's a Bentley park out, <laughs> yeah, right a Bentley out there. <laughs> That's his work car, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so we don't have any relation to the Bentley yeah. car brand whatsoever. Uh, we've worked with them to make sure we don't infringe on anything, but gotcha, we do yeah. own the rights to use the name Bentley um, and the brand Bentley in the tobacco world. And I don't know if. I don't, so, so, like, the trademarks are separate then? Yeah. All right, good, yeah. So, I don't know if this is a coincidence or not. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence. It hasn't been told to me, and I wasn't there in 1970 when the brand was created, but Bentley Motors went bankrupt mm. in 1970. Hmm. It would be a weird coincidence yeah. if they didn't have something to do with that. Most likely, in my opinion, probably what happened was... Uh, Bentley was restructuring. They're trying to figure out the next step is. And like other companies like Gucci did this, they lic- they probably licensed the rights to use names. And they were like, all right, we're restructuring. So let's, and I don't know this for a fact, but I was like, let's license this out to some luxury things to build Bentley back up. Let's, yeah. well, let's restructure it. It'll get things out there. So what's, what's luxury in the seventies? Pipes, pipe tobacco, walking sticks, canes that you don't need to use, things like that. And, uh, I'm assuming that's probably what happened. It would be, the odds of that being just a random coincidence yeah. uh, is crazy because like th- this font here is is the Bentley font. Yeah, it's a very similar. Yeah. It, it's you know it is. It's the same font. It's the oh, Bentley okay. brand. Yeah. Um, so there's like things we can't do it. Like I can't take this Bentley font and like give it to a retailer for them to recreate it and use it for things. Like we can use mm-hmm. it. Gotcha. Because yeah, gotcha. we have the trademark stuff, but there's very specific things that can do with it and things that we can and can't do with the logo. Um, you know, redesigning it and whatnot. Um, so we, so we worked with them to make sure there's no issues, but we do have the trademark on it. But I, I, I mean, it had to have had something to do yeah. with them. But too, uh, like, yeah. kind of like Bajero was saying, it's a, when it comes to the trademark, one's for cars, one's for tobacco. Exactly. So there's no conflict there of is, interest. There is no, yeah. it's, it's not related whatsoever. We are not the car company. Uh, we have nothing to do with them. Uh, it was just the brand Bentley was, was there and well, we, we owned the right to use it. could foresee a potential collaboration between if, the two. If Bentley called me up and said, Hey, can you come to this car show and sell Bentley cigars here? I would say absolutely no problem whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and we call us, say, Hey, do you guys want to come too? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And you know, we obviously retailers, uh, there's a here in San 
Sanford. Uh, there's yeah. a cars and cigars thing they do in Sanford once a quarter. You know, we were there. And people came up to like, that's not the Bentley it, logo. It and I'm like, stuff. exactly. Yeah. It's not the Bentley logo. Like, it's not the <laughs> Bentley car logo. Thank, thank you for noticing. <laughs> yeah. That, perfect. Uh, but you know, there's obviously some interest in it and, and the, the names a recognizable brand and, uh, and it's, it's synonymous with luxury. Did so, any Bentley yeah. show up to that car show? I wasn't able to make it. Uh, one did. Okay. One nice. did. And it was cause the owner, Tom and I were joking around and I said, I'll get some Bentleys out the next time if you want some Bentleys for the car show. And he's like, don't worry. I'll take care of it. And five <laughs> minutes later, he had one of his buddies show up and, uh, he had a Bentley SUV. He's like, can we get some pictures with it? I was like, I can't. They go, it's not associated. Mm. So I go, I can't have it in there. Um, uh, not, not just can't. I wouldn't do it. We're not supposed yeah, yeah, we can't yeah, do yeah, it. Like, yeah, why, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. well, why would you, why rock the boat on something that's, that's already settled for, for the sake of something that you don't need to do. Right. So, yeah. so yeah, there's no, if they did come, we would certainly go. And then in, in Europe, they've done some things. Bentley's communicated with them and they've, hey, can you come and come and do some cigar stuff with us? No, you know, the, uh, our customers would love it. And yeah. yeah so they, there's, there's, there's that obviously collaborations. Other, other things that you look like that, like luxury brands in the past that had things like that, like Gucci. Gucci like like hoard themselves out though. That was a problem. Like, they were on everything. Yeah. Um, if you ever watch that movie House of Gucci, it's a really cool movie. But one of their big issues they had was when they were restructuring, they just put their they put their Gucci brand on everything. So it was like Gucci lighters, like yeah. Gucci this, Gucci that. Yep. And um and there's a part in that movie where the uh the father, whatever his first name was, Gucci last name. He was like, wow, he goes, this is, we're making money on this. And like one of the brothers didn't want to do it. And then they were like, we can't be this. It's not luxury. So that was part of, you know, restructuring companies. People, people have done things like Davidoff had done that in the past. I don't think they want to business, but they had Davidoff cool water cologne that has nothing yeah, to do yeah, with yeah, them yeah. anymore. Yeah. Uh, but it's the exact same logo. There's is identical. Uh, it used to be Davidoff cigarette company. Um, that kind of died off. Um, but you know, companies, it's not like an unheard of thing where there's luxury brands that, that, uh, that are owned by separate entities that have some difference, but then some similarities. Yeah, yeah that's true. It bring up a good point too. I, I was just thinking about Davidoff Cologne and I didn't realize too until you said it, it is the same exact logo, but yeah, it's exactly the same. They licensed the whole thing and then sold it and it, they sold the rights to use it in like that. That space, so they yeah. can use it. They don't own it anymore. Uh, so I, I said, I don't know in 1970 how it went down, but it's a. I looked at, I googled yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, the, there's no way that this that this didn't have some sort of a business deal that went down to to spread the rights out to use this type of of uh, branding yeah. and other things. It was the same exact time period. Like, yeah, it was the exact same year in the exact same country. I'm, yeah. I'm not gonna lie until right now. I thought they were the Davidoff were the same brand. Well, they used to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it was a separate brand underneath them because Davidoff, mm -hmm. I had a conversation with someone. They were like, uh, European companies have never done a good job here in the U.S. Uh, they're like, the people have tried, those European companies have tried to come over. Balmoral was one that did pretty well. They were sold by Drew Estate. Uh, the only challenge they had is they got sold. They were owned by this company, Royal Agio, and Agio sold shortly after. Um, and they killed the, they murdered the, uh, the premium side brand because they were being purchased for their, their mass market stuff. Um, and I said to them, I was like, what do you mean European companies haven't done well here? They're like, name one. I go, Davidoff. And they're like, well, that doesn't count. I go, what do you mean it doesn't <laughs> count? They have Davidoff, uh, they have one. like, they have Davidoff entities in all these other countries and they have one called Davidoff USA, which is their biggest entity. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of premium stuff, so it's like, like, what do you mean it doesn't count? Uh, well, just because I gave you a good answer, it doesn't count? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Set through well, is another one. <laughs> that may or may not count. <laughs> <laughs> that one doesn't count, though. But <laughs> I'm going to try the uh, Corona size. Wait. See, your guys' cigars are going so much faster than mine because I'm not shutting up. We're, I warned you prior to talking. going on. I warned you prior to going on that I was not going to shut up. That's fine. If people come on and do that, and I say, great. It makes my job easier. Yeah. I was on a podcast one time and um, it's called The Cigar Authority. I'll name it. Yeah. Right? They're good friends of mine. And I was on the show and a guy sent into their mailbag and they read it on the show the next time I was on about how I came off as cocky, a know-it-all, <laughs> oh, acting like I was an expert and this and that. And, and so I... <clears throat> 
Who said this? Like a person. Uh, you got uh, art. Somebody, got. somebody watching the show. <laughs> oh. And I was like, I was brought on to do that. I was brought on to talk about what I know. Well, God forbid you bring knowledge to this conversation. <laughs> that was what I was brought on to be. And, and then also, I was, I was the guest. You know, yeah, like, yeah, that yeah. was the that, point. That same yeah. person would also complain if you were a guest and you knew nothing about cigars. Yeah, and you didn't talk. About yeah, you yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I was yeah. just saying, we, you, you know, know, it happens. We have guests yeah. that yeah. So, well, shut up after five minutes. I'm yeah, like, yeah. uh, okay. If, if we could pause for a second and you talk to Alex, hey, man, this guy's coming off a little cocky. We need to tone him down. We'll wrap it up. We'll wrap it up. So it's funny because <laughs> Dave Garofalo, the owner, yeah. Went in on the guy, and he was like, yeah. well, "He's like, well, what do you expect?" And Jonathan, the other guy on the show, uh, he was nice to me. He said, "You know, he, you know, he was, you know, he did talk a little more than usual. It was probably a little heated. We were talking about some more heated topics." And he's like, "No, I understand where you're coming from. He's a great guy, and whatever." And the guy replied, "Thank you, and you know, appreciate the feedback. You know, I'll give him another shot." Dave went friggin' scorched earth on him on the air <laughs> on like the after show. And he was like, he's like, he was the guest and he goes, he literally was an expert on the questions that we were asking. Like we were asking yeah. questions about his brand, asking him questions about like the cigar world. The, was like, it LFD related? It was, well, it was some LFD related. Then there was other stuff they were asking. It was the, I think the theme of the show was like, what goes on out there when you're on the road? Okay. Yeah, so and, something and, that you know about 98 hotel nights. Um, so it was hilarious, but I didn't know what they were going to do. Dave went scorched earth on the guy and he's like, ah, whatever. At the end of it, he's like, ah, if, if you don't like it, then he goes, you're just not going to like him. <laughs> That's so weird, actually. Yeah. yeah. It, it was a really interesting comment. I was like, what, what, what did you think I was going to be on the show and not talk? Like yeah, it was yeah. the high, they advertised I was going to be on there. <laughs> yeah. You're just kind of there to fill a space, look pretty, you know, <laughs> yeah. like. <laughs> yeah. I do want to say, I like this little note on the back. Thanks for smoking. It's a nice, nice little. It's um. It says thanks for smoking Bentley, right? Yeah. <laughs> Did yeah, you create that? Was that your idea? No, they had it done. It. I, oh, okay. It was an idea I had, but they had already done it. Because I love the little slit there. At first, I thought this was separated. Uh huh. This is not my first Bentley, but just I've been dying to say this. Yeah. So there's a little slit right here, which is really unique. Most mm-hmm. of, you know, most bands don't have that. Mm-hmm. So I like it is a lot. cool. Yeah, yeah. It's visually appealing, aesthetically. Yeah. It um. Well, the band too. It's it, it's not thin. It's very yep. um like high quality and thick the yeah. bands are made in holland at oh, this okay. really great factory and it was a couple things that I, when i was talking about it i noticed i was like hey i go it's great that you put that inside the band i like it people do notice it um i was like that was something that would be on my list of things that i was doing building a brand they just kind of they did everything i was like you guys did I mean, you had to have worked with somebody that knew what they were doing they're like absolutely like yeah. we, we hired real professionals, which never happens in the cigar business. The cigar business is, is kind of known for hiring people that are like half professionals at certain things. Cause we're great at stuff. Like the business is really good at entrepreneurial sides. It's good at working hard workers. Yeah. You kind of have to be, um, you know, the knowledge of tobacco is great, but there's just some things that they don't do well, like marketing and branding. Yeah. Um, and like the best ones in this company that have done it have hired professionals to come in and be like, all right, we're good. How do we become great? Uh, Perdomo is one of those. Perdomo is like incredibly well marketed and branded. Um, and they had professional help, professional help that came in and was like, yeah, you do this, 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 and it works. And if you do it that way, it will make sense. Um, so they just nailed, you know, they nailed some things right. Like the, uh, all the logos, the brand liveries are all nice. Like I said, that the little simple thing of printing something on the back of the band, the band has a weight to it. So it feels good yeah, when you does. take it off. It makes yeah. you want to look at it. Exactly. And yeah, then you're yeah, like, oh, thank you for, well, you're welcome for smoking, right? <laughs> yeah, I thought it, those, it, yeah. it feels good when you put it on your pinky as a pinky ring, you know, mm-hmm. while you're smoking it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they, they, we did a lot of right things with it and they did that and, uh, it was great. And so yeah, it's kind of our catchphrase. You know, people tag online. I, I tag them a little B if they share a picture and if they comment, I put a little, you know, little, thanks for smoking. Uh, thanks for smoking Bentley. Yeah. Well, brand recognition is a huge thing, especially in an industry like this. So anything you can do to, Make customers realize, okay, yeah, Bentley, they see Bentley, 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 or any other product. That's like the biggest thing, especially in an industry like this. Where, like, for example, you walk into Corona, there's th- hundreds of different faces in there. So, what makes you stand out mm-hmm. in a humidor full of hundreds of different cigars? And Do people is- like stop you and they see your shirt and they're like, Bentley cigars instead of like Bentley the motors at all? I haven't had any Bentley cigars yet, other than people that have known it and then they see me with it that I know. Uh, so nobody stopped me yet with that. Uh, uh, well, that'll be a good moment when somebody notices it as Bentley cigars, which would be really cool. It's not in this, they made that I don't know. From Wait, there's a media. car yeah, but, called Bentley. Yeah. <laughs> but if not, it's a great talking point, right? To get them, you know, started into the cigar. Instantly great talking point. Yeah. I, I had a guy last night. He's like, 
he, this is really cool how it happened because it's there. They weren't. I was looking at these cigars. And I'm like, this looks really nice, all laid out. Like the branding's nice. It's beautiful. I go, and I know that when they smoke, it, it's you know, if it hits their palate right, the quality of it's going to be there. They may want something fuller bodied or whatever, but that's a different, you know, different thing or a different flavor profile. But I'm like, if they're willing to try it, this is going to look great. You know, it's going to work for them too. And one thing happened that I thought was crazy. The guy's like, get me one of those Bentleys. And I was like, that's pretty cool. Like, he just was like, I'm like, which one? He's like, the green one. And I was like, perfect. I'm like, that's exactly how that's supposed to make sense. Easy to get it. You like saying it. And uh, and it was cool. It was the first time I really had somebody say, like, oh, get me one of those Bentleys. And I was like, that's really cool. So I was that was the concept. And that's hopefully what will happen with it and how it becomes recognizable. Yeah. And, and it's said, an easy thing for people to get involved in and easy to make a choice with. And it doesn't hurt to, like, thank people, right? Um, that's short. That's a shortage of that in the world. I mean, even if I can't just say it to you in person, uh, you know, having it on the band, they, you know, they took time to think in adding something and what was added into it wasn't a Q, you know, wasn't a, uh, a discount code wasn't some joke. It was, it was, you know, the thought went in to say thank you to you. You know, hey, they they took the extra second to say, you know, let's put something inside because it's gonna we need something in there. And when we do do it, it should be like thanking you for participating in it. Yeah. We had a similar conversation last week. We're talking about the service industry and how it's not as personal anymore. A lot of places you go to, but when you do go to a place where the service is excellent, you want to go back there all the time. Kind of similar to where a lot of people don't show their thanks for supporting the brand. And that's a huge thing nowadays too. It's like, hey, I letting people know I appreciate you for supporting the brand. Uh, I appreciate the, co- the consumers and the customers for supporting us. So that, that right there is a big thing too, is like having people know that you appreciate what you're doing and it it revolves around everything we've kind of been talking about it's simple right we we've forgotten as a culture about simplicity simplicity doesn't need to mean that it's basic it doesn't need to mean that it's not elegant Mm -hmm. i use the reference of like real high-end fine dining like michelin star restaurants very simple dishes with incredibly thought out techniques right it's a small, you have like a 20 course dinner and everything's this small little dish with very noticeable ingredients. They're telling you what it is. And it's like, this is, you know, this is a pea with pea tendrils and pea sauce and pea this. And it's like, I just, all I ate was pea and it was the best pea I've ever had. <laughs> uh, that was probably a bad example. Yeah. Jared uh, likes pea too. <laughs> yeah. where, where did you, where did you go that you had a 20 course meal? Uh, cause I want to go there. Yeah, there, was a, go. there was a spot in Las Vegas. It's called A. It's by Jose Andres. Um, it's in this restaurant called Haleo. It's a private dining area. It's like 12 people and they do like, there's actually 27 courses. Okay. The max I ever had was like 13. So I was yeah. kind of like, I'm like halfway that there. That was out of control. Cause once you got to like course 15, you're, you're like, you were, you were, you were like, oh man, this is pretty good. Then you got to 15 and 16. You're like, stop, stop, no more. And then you got more. <laughs> uh, but again, it's simple. It's basic. So things that are simple don't have to mean that, that it's not elegant. And, and I think we forget that there's simple things like simply saying hello to someone or smiling. Uh, it's really easy. If, if even if you're in a bad mood, if you're in a bad mood, you can make somebody else in a bad mood real quick. If you're in a bad mood and you make somebody happy, you can still be in your bad mood, but then you didn't spread it to someone else. So it falls, in my opinion, around simple is elegance and simple can be luxury. Um, and that's kind of the focus with with all of this, and I think it should be the more of a focus for other people too. So a simple thank you goes a long way, right? And that kind of goes yeah. back to what you were saying earlier is not being complicated either, because when things are too complicated, then people get confused, and then it's like, like you said, I'm just here to relax. I don't want to have to overthink my choice in cigars. So simple is good. It's not basic, but it's also not complicated. So you look at like, go to like Chipotle, right? So Chipotle, you line up. Do you want a burrito, a salad, or you want what? Whatever the options are. Yeah, but you, all, you already know what you're doing going in. Mm-hmm. But just go down the line and like, all right, I'll take that, 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 and that. Yeah. Boom, done. Um, and that's worked really, really well. Um, if they would say thank you and be nicer, uh, you know, I think that would go a long way too. <laughs> that is true. That but is true. Simplicity does Chipotle have its successes. Lake Mary. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, dude, the uh, the the one Chipotle that have you ever the best Chipotle is the one in Altamont. No, you're, you're the one in Castleberry. 
I haven't been to that. The one in Altamont's epic. Is it? There's this lady there, and she's just like, she runs the show. She's got to probably be in her 60s. She's just sweet, kind, nice. Like, thank you for coming in. And it's <laughs> it's like, going to, it's like she must have worked for Chick-fil-A. And if she hadn't, they're Chipotle's exactly, paying. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But the Chick-fil-A by me is nasty. Really? It's just nasty. Yeah. Oh, Orlando Avenue. Which Chick-fil-A? Park. Oh, okay. Yeah, nasty. Oh, that one. I, I went to that one a few months ago. Oh. I was like, what is this? I'm going yeah. back to Lake yeah, Mary. Yeah, yeah. It's just nasty. See, um, the one in uh, Casabury, they're really mean, but they hook it up. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's give and take. Yeah, 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 <laughs> What's yeah. your uh, normal order at uh, Chipotle? Uh, mine, I do a burrito bowl with uh, f- double meat, chicken, and steak. I do uh, the corn, the tomato, sour cream, cheese, lettuce. Black beans and brown rice. I could have said everything, but <laughs> yeah. it's not quite everything. no, I don't do like the fajita stuff. Um, oh, the vegetables? Yeah, I don't do any of the salsas that oh, they have I other than that. the pico. Yeah. Um, that pico's I, good. Then yeah, I yeah. add a ton of the green jalapeno Tabasco. But but it is it's simple simple things and and simple things are very elegant and elegant. I know we've talked about fast food because we got a lot of areas around here that have good great service. And I go to like I go to the Jersey Mike's by me because they're just super nice. They go in and say call, say hi to me and use my name every day. Um, it's really nice stuff. And they say thank you, which is really yeah. nice too. Yeah. But you know, on the high end high end level of things, they do the simple things right. Um, and it's not hard to do the simple things right. Um, it is once you get too confusing, you get too big. You know, these fast food chains we're talking about have thousands of restaurants. So it's hard to do that a thousand times over, which is one of the main focuses I said is we try to keep this relatively small and manageable. Mm-hmm. How do we maintain that? And part by maintain, it's not, you know, staying in your lane and understanding what your lane is and then doing a great job driving in that lane. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I mean, also, side note before I forget. This is probably my favorite size so far, the Corona, um, in both the green and the white. And I think that's just because of my personal preference. Like we talked about before, Corona for me is one of the good. So I, I prefer thinner ring gauges generally. So for me, I came off from smoking and, and being an executive for a company that made complete Dominican ass kickers, right? So I started smoking. The first thing I grabbed was the green. And I'm like, ah, eh, I don't, you know, my palate's shot at this point. And when I, when I smoked Nicaragua, and I didn't tend to smoke a lot of Hoyt in Nicaragua, um, loved the factory. It just, I, I was a big Padron smoker and I still am. Yeah. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, this is really different on my palate. I'm like, it's going to take me a bit to get adapted to smoking medium bodied cigars. And so I went on to the Connecticut and I was like, man, this is really freaking good. And same thing. I was like, man, this tastes like some like good Cubans I've had. Um, and, and there's going to be Cuban smokers like, no, oh, nothing. They're just saying it for Mark. I'm not saying Mark. It, it has similarities yeah. to it. There's, it's not Cuban tobacco, obviously. And two, again, I said that to him. Yeah. That it tastes like a Cuban cigar. I have zero affiliation with this company. Yeah. So I'm like, this is really freaking good. So I just blew through a bunch of Connecticut's and then I jumped back into the green and it made me appreciate the green better because it kind of reset my palate, I think. Uh, but I still find myself going towards the Connecticut and then I do find myself smoking the Robustos or the Corona. And given the choice, I grab the Corona. Um, regularly. And I, I understand people smoke larger sizes and they want more time out of it. You know, a $13 Corona is not crazy, but if you're going to smoke three of them, uh, and you could smoke like one Toro or yeah. one Churchill, you know, for $16, uh, I could spend $40 or 16. And I think, you know, I understand you probably would buy the larger and then maybe buy one of the smaller ones to have a, you know, a second cigar. But uh, given the option of grabbing it, Unfortunately, I have the luxury of being able to do that is I'm not grabbing based off of price point. I'm grabbing solely off of what I want to smoke. Um, so, you know, I'll burn through three or four Coronas in two and a half hours and, you know, not lose sleep about it and just really enjoy it. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point, though, because sometimes, too, I will say I'll go into a cigar lounge and I'll be like, I want to be here for a long time. I just want a big cigar. I'm not really going to be picky about, you know, how it tastes or whatever. But then you go in another time and it's like, I want to have a really great experience taste wise and everything like that that's when you get like a corona or something mm-hmm. and you know if i want to go in and be here a long time i just want to get one cigar i'm going to get a churchill something larger mm-hmm. yeah so yeah. what are the price points of these uh so again simple the uh so we have corona uh, robusto toro churchill uh they're 13 14 15 and 16 there you go yeah. great pricing yep yeah and 
10, 15. Uh, it's too confusing. Sorry, we're touching, <laughs> touching toes and legs. I keep over. moving, but I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I think I was playing footsies. <laughs> uh, well, maybe. That was the first foot touch. Um, <laughs> uh, I, dis- I disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, what did you ask? Oh, I was talking about pricing. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Uh, 10, 15, 10 or 15 years ago, if you had, if you'd gone and brought cigars out, you know, Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen dollars cigars ten years ago were were real pricey. I'm not saying it's not a uh, a, a low, it's not a low price point by any means, uh, but it's it's a sweet spot in pricing right now. Yeah, it's become uh, more normal. You got real high end stuff coming out, hundreds of dollars, but you know you got a lot. Most you know real limited edition things are coming out twenty, thirty, forty, fifty dollars. Um, so the price breaks changed a little bit, and also I yeah. think the quality of the cigars have, have improved over the last ten or fifteen years too. So it justifies that price, but there has been price increases, which, you know, which has made it to a point where you can come at 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 bucks. Yeah. And, and people aren't like, man, that's crazy. No, if you smoke under $10 cigars exclusively, yeah, this is not in your price range. Um, you know, and that's, that's fine. There's great cigars, uh, under $10. There's, you know, you can find things that fit in any price point that are going to be, you know, serve their purpose. Um, so if that's a price break for you, you just don't go over $10. Obviously, you're not going to touch this, but, uh, there's a significant portion of the market now that does go over that. Um, especially in the environments of cigar lounges, cigar bars in a cigar bar setting. This is incredibly reasonable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. No, for sure. I think, um, I mean, we say it all the time. The average now feels like. It's around fifteen, fifteen dollars. Yeah. That's so what I was yeah. gonna say, man. For me, when I go in and look at cigars, if you ask me what's the average cigar in a brick and mortar retailer um, that I see go in and out, and it's probably like I said there's people buying bundles or whatever. But you know, when you take that stuff out, I I would say the same thing. Yeah. Fifteen yeah. would be what I'd say. Right That's off like the top your of middle ground. So you say if I want to get a cheap cigar, it's under fifteen dollars. Yep. If I want to yep. spend money, it's over ten, fifteen, and twenty. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And then over twenty, I'm making a decision of like if it's over twenty. I'm making a decision. Okay. If it's over 20, what brand is it? Who made it? What's the yeah. story? And then I'm, you know, then I'll go over. That's when you're like, I have to know it's good. Uh-huh. I've already had to try it once before. Like if you're buying a, you know, like $50 Alfonso, it's like, okay, you have to know that cigar is going to be good. Mm-hmm. Just taking in some smoke. No, I'm the same thing with it. Um, you know, if something that has no name to it comes out of $30, I'm not touching yeah. it. Yeah. I agree. Like, like absolutely <laughs> I agree. not. You have to have like, 20 people come up to me and say, you yeah. have to try this. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, because at $20 above, I'm going to smoke Padron, Davidoff, Fuente, yeah. Yeah. Opus. Reputable. Um, yeah. Cigars. I mean, th- those really are like the four or five that I'll smoke over 20 bucks or, you know, or some other limited edition things that come up from people that I know. Uh, but you know, from my personal smoking repertoire, what I smoke at like 20 to $30, it's probably a Padron, mm-hmm. probably a, uh, Davidoff, uh, Maybe an opus. Um, it, that's really it, you know, for, for I'm grabbing. Now I, I do try other things as other people making great cigars at those price points. That's just for what I tend to grab. That's tends to be yeah. what it is. No, for sure. I think when you're spending that much money anyway, most people are probably in the same boat where it's like, you know, I'm getting a Padron or an opus or maybe a Davidoff. Well, it's like, it's like when you find a car you like. So my wife got a one of she got a big promotion last year and another one this year. She wanted a Porsche Macan, mm. and the guy's like, "Once you get a Porsche, he goes, you're not going to want something else." He's like, "You're just going to get comfortable with it." And mm. there's other cars in that price range you might try out, but if they do the things right, they're right. The service is good. It's real easy to do it. You like it. The vehicles move. The vehicles feel nice. Generally, you get into it in a lease that's three years. So you're going to go into a new one anyway. Yeah. They make it easy for you just to roll into a brand new car. So you do things when you spend money. You do things that you're comfortable spending that money with. You know, if you go on a vacation to nice areas and spend a ton of money. People tend to vacation in the same areas because they know what they're getting. Yeah. If they don't vacation in the same area or the same type of concept in different areas somewhere else, they they tend to not do it because you don't want to just go try it for ten thousand dollars and and lose. That's why timeshares did great. You know, you bought an area and you're like, you you're gonna know the vacation you get down here in Orlando is gonna be great. And if you want to try other things, you can exchange it into other places, but you're still doing the same type of concept. Yeah. And then, but you come back to what you're comfortable with. And I think is the higher price point you get, the, the least, the less risk you're going to take on trying something else. Yeah. And two, it's part of its convenience. It's like, listen, I'm already basically like locked in this brand or this company. So it makes sense to just keep going and working with the mm-hmm. same people, especially if they're doing good work. Yep, that's how I will get you. 
<laughs> True. <laughs> so uh taking a step back like ten or twenty years, you mentioned that you smoked um flavored cigars. Yep. Yeah. Is that still a thing? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I probably have one or two flavored cigars like, um, in here. Was that like your entryway into cigars, or like how did you? What was your first like you know brand the, the first you remember? Cigar I ever smoked yeah. was uh, Black and Mild. Uh, so it wasn't a premium cigar, but it was Same. Black and Mild. I was like nineteen. Uh, I was an athlete, so I didn't smoke or drink until I got to like twenty, and then um then I drank and smoked a lot. Um, but As my first does. like real premium cigar yeah, yeah. was uh you know I don't I don't classify flavored as premium cigars any longer just personally um nice. but, but they are technically but um yeah it's okay we'll, we'll, we'll back we agree yeah, yeah, we, we, <laughs> yeah, we agree so yeah so cao flavors were the first one i have the uh the cherry was the first one and then the then the first actual real premium cigar that i ever bought was at corona it was the cao anniversary maduro it had the uh, red band on it. it was awesome so that was the first real cigar that i bought uh, uh with that the first the first cigar experience, not purchasing outside of the flavored stuff. My buddy Jim was like a Romeo and Juliet, a Cuban that we had. Uh, he had these little Coronas that were really cool. So we smoked those and that's, and then we started getting into cigars because we were smoking a cigar every, every couple of days on, um, in our dorm area. And, uh, then we started researching and then we're like, wait a minute, we're in this town, this place called Corona. And then I'm like, then I moved like a mile down the street from it. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Then downtown opened up. And then we started going to cigar events and going out to have uh, margaritas and cigars. Then, then we got involved in a bunch of like cigar clubs from like online stuff. And then we realized we're like, this isn't as good as the stuff we're getting at Corona because we were handpicking good cigars where they're handpicking things that they were trying to get rid of. It doesn't mean they were bad, but it just wasn't what we were smoking. So then we went back to Corona and we're like, okay, then we became real brick and mortar driven. Because that was the experience we liked. Uh, you know, we, even if we were going to smoke at home, cause we had, you know, we had like a little lounge area set up and you guys got a nice studio here. So I'm sure you smoke here a lot, but you know, we liked going to a cigar place mm-hmm. and buying the cigars that we were smoking. <clears throat> yeah. The experience. And, and I'm, I'm smoking the one way. there and then bringing one back and ex- bringing the experience home. Did you live on campus? I did, the fir- I did the first year. So yeah. you're like the only freshman with a cigar, probably. <laughs> we we had we we created a, a group of cigar smokers, and people wanted because they were nobody had any money. Yeah. So if you had a friend that had money, you had access to certain things like alcohol or whatever. And, and fortunately, we had a small friends group, and we had you know I had a good buddy of mine that was uh, well off, so we had access to things, and, and he had finer things like you know people like oh what's that a cigar oh cool. So they sat with us and we'd hang out. But yeah, we were the first ones doing it for sure. Nice. Uh, so yeah, we lived on campus that first year. Then I moved over to this side of town. Yeah. No one's cooler than a cigar guy on a college campus. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say too, I went to, um, my buddy invited me to a um, tailgate slash fraternity event at UF years ago. And I brought a few cigars and we lit up the cigars and everyone's like, oh, you guys got cigars? Like, I'm like, yeah, you know, just for us, but no one's cooler than a cigar guy on ca- uh, college campus. I, so I've done a lot of cigar events on college campuses. So there's a game coming up this weekend. Uh, Alabama's playing Tennessee. It's called a cigar game. So when we were at LFD, a very good friend of mine owns a shop in Tuscaloosa. It's called R&R Cigars, the cigar mansion. So we made a cigar for the cigar game because the concept is the winning team lights up in the stadium. That's cool. And it'd been going on for like a hundred years. So we started doing the cigars. So we'd go up and it was wild. So there's, there's a cool story. I was sitting there this one time and we got, I don't know if I'm allowed to say where we got the tickets, but we had tickets and they were good tickets. Uh, good to the point where the people sitting behind me, his name was Nick Saban. And so if you follow college football, all Nick Saban was, you know, was the goat of college football. And it was his son. So his son sat behind me and we go, Alabama been, destroys uh, Tennessee almost every year. Tennessee won last year, which was kind of cool. So they got to light up. But, um, so it's like end of the third quarter. And we're like, when we can light up? Cause it's legal to do it, but they just kind of let it go. Cause you're yeah. on the way out. Right. So they start pushing the envelope a little bit. So I'm like, when can we light up, Reagan? He's like, you can light up whenever you want. He's like, I don't fucking care. The game's over. So I smell a cigar and I turn around and Saban's son, Nick, lit up a cigar. And I'm like, I'm like, if Nick Saban smoke and John Carney can certainly smoke. <laughs> That's what I said to him. I was like, if you can smoke, I can. He's like, light up. So I light up and, uh, 
I had an LG, uh, Dominican Puro that Lido made, 100% wrapper, binder, filler. Uh, it's like his opus. And uh, I don't work for them anymore. I can say open. I can say it's like his opus now. Because um, that the concept of Opus X is it's Dominican Puro, wrapper, binder, filler, all from one estate, one farm, one country. And uh, so I light it up. And I feel like this tap on my shoulder. He's like, yo, bro. I'm like, what? He's like, your cigar smells way better than mine. <laughs> and I'm like, I go, what are you smoking? I won't say what he had, but um, I was like, you want Acid? one? <laughs> no, it was actually, it was, a good, it was a very good brand, but it was not like the good version of it. Gotcha, it was yeah, just a yeah. real mild, mild one. And I was like, yeah, I got one more. You want one? So he's like, yeah, sure. So I cut and lit it. Nick Saban and I are smoking LGs in the stadium uh, for this was at the end of the third quarter. So we was like game over at third quarter. So we smoked in the stadium for like an hour. It was freaking awesome. And there's like 70,000 people that light up and there's smoke going across the stadium. So watch for this weekend because the winning team will smoke it. Yeah. yeah. And um, I don't know what time the game's on. But I did a lot of things up there in Alabama. But you're right. There was nobody cooler than a cigar person in a college campus at a sporting event or anything. Um, because people want to they, something that's new to them. They haven't tried it. Or there are people there that have and they like cigars. But, well, it's uh, like a luxury yeah, thing, too. Huge, yeah, 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 huge. It's like, oh, you're smoking a cigar. So this is a, an elevated event now. This is a <laughs> it's more classy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder what happened to that UCF uh, cigar group you created, you know? Like, is it still live today? We didn't really create a group. It was like a casual. There was hangout. a uh, so most colleges you can create like a club, yeah, and they'll provide funding for your club. So there was uh, there still might be, but there there was a group that started a cigar smokers group at UCF, and they used oh, to really? reach out to me That's every once cool. in a I'm while. I'm kind of surprised they allowed that, honestly, like given tobacco. But. Well, it, it's it was uh, it was it was like a cultural thing, you know. So mm. it's like, what are you going to say? You can't do something cultural, mm. and it they wasn't like they didn't have like a cigarette smoking group. Yeah, it was premium. I've ripped this whole thing off. It was premium, uh, premium cigars, and there was like their their dedication and what they said was like to the culture of of the of cigars. So it was it was it was an educational thing, and they they did a good job with it. It may still exist, but this was probably five or six years ago. And uh, so I hadn't heard from them from a while. I think the guys probably graduated and moved on, and who knows? It's like the original Cigar University, (laughs) Mm -hmm. not university. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Nice. We can bring it back. Is anybody attending that right now? Like grad school or anything? Our YouTube followers. (laughs) (laughs) All right, boys, let's do this. Uh, I'm an alum. I'm an alumni. You know, we can go in on it. There we go. Our our, our other, our fourth. Uh, co-host Zach, he was, he started, he started grad school, right? Yeah. Uh, he, he decided not to, but he's probably the closest to UCF alumni we have right now. You're an alumni, but it's yeah. been a while. He's still got like, you know, he's still fresh out of it. I mean, once an alumni, always an alumni, but yeah. we just have to, we'd have to have a connection with someone to help have them start it. Um, but it might, I said it might already exist. I know. So if anybody was watching that knows that, let us know. Yeah. We're, we're in. You want another one or are you? No, uh, yeah, I'll take another one. I recommend going with the Connecticut next, or or did you do the, did you do the Connecticut yeah, or the green? No, he did uh, the I green. Did green. Which green did you smoke? Did you do the Corona? Churchill. Oh, well, I know you want to do the Corona, right? Do I the did, white. Do the white. I do the white. I do, I do the, the white. white. John, do you mind if I have one? I do. Me do, too. Do you mind? I do mind. Um, <laughs> no, would you? Uh, I would recommend doing the white it's, next uh, too. Nice. Thank you. It's twelve dollars now, though. So just cash app him. He has the uh, <laughs> he has cash app on his phone. So I, I got a POS system on my phone for a little pop up restaurant I do. So you can just run. We can just ring it all through there. There you go. <laughs> pop up restaurant. You have a ghost kitchen. Uh, so my father in law has a catering license. So one of the things I threw off the wall was I grew up in the restaurant business. So I, I do. Yeah. We own three restaurants. One of them was a roadside stand, ice cream, burgers, fries, secret family honoring recipe. It's called the Snack Shack. So uh, a buddy of mine that owns Forward Slash in Winter Park, we made a bourbon with called Bull's Breath. Um, I was like, wait a minute. I'm like not doing anything right now. You have pop-up restaurants. I've got a catering license that I can legally do pop-ups with. I said, why don't we do the snack shack? He's like, oh, that'd be great. So on Sundays, we've been doing that. Um, <clears throat> last week, we took off because I was out of town. But it turned into a fun group. And they have a, a, a tent outside that you can – they set tables and chairs and ashtrays up. So I've had you know, a group of friends come over. We do burgers, fries, smoke cigars. Um, so it's turned into something fun. And it was what I was doing was just in case I needed something um, to make a little bit of money. 
that's one thing that I was doing. And the only challenge is that I started it right in the middle of the summer. And the last thing people want to do is eat like Wagyu beef tallow French fries outdoors when it's a hundred. Yeah. Um, the restaurant industry also slows down in the summer big time. It does. And then they, they had only been open on Sundays there for about a month. We start, so they're slowly building that business over there on Sundays. They initially had been closed. Uh, so no, it does really well, but it turned into more of like a fun time, uh, which is great and, you know, turns into a little bit of money. And we, we do all yeah. locally sur- source burgers. Uh, the fries are all fresh cut, cooked in Wagyu beef tallow. And, uh, it's, it's a really mm. fun thing. The, the buns are all made, made by Old Earth, which is a big bakery here in town. Um, so yeah, it was fun. And we do that on Sundays and smoke cigars and drink bourbon and eat. Very cool. But hopefully the weather cools off here in the next few weeks so it turns into a little bit yeah. uh, larger crowd because it's it's been fun, but I can hang out with my buddies and not have to prep yeah, yeah. 50 burgers every week that I got to figure out if, how many I'm going to thaw because once they're thawed, you got to you got to cook them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I uh, you know, it's it's a guessing game. Yeah. Well, if you ever need to stop by, I mean, it might be a little difficult with scheduling, but I'm more than happy to come. <laughs> <laughs> It's a public business, so you're are, welcome. Are you busy all on Sunday? I heard burgers, so I'm 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 free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they we they're really cool. It was fun because my dad started in 1972, so we the first weekend that we were open, we celebrated our 52nd anniversary. So on my logo is <laughs> Snack Shack, established 1972. So it's been fun. Uh, so like what I did with Shoulders of Giants, the leadership newsletter we did, that was something my dad's done for years. So we brought that, which was fun. And then I took his restaurant concept. So it kind of, you know, brought back some of his, uh, building his, on his legacy. And it's been fun things for the both of us. He and I, you know, he and I have worked on different things and he's like, oh, the snack shack go. And yeah, uh, the one thing we were doing, we have a secret family onion ring recipe. I'm sorry, say like that again? Challenge. We have a secret family onion recipe. <laughs> What's in it? It's a batter dipped, it's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a batter dipped onion ring. Um, now one yeah. thing, so we did it. And the problem is it ruins the oil real quick because mm. it absorbs the oil and it just, the batter spreads. There's a lot of like little particles that get yeah, out. Yeah, they spread. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, all right, we're going to have to ax these onion rings, which were like what we did because I don't have the professionals filtering that you would have in like a, in a restaurant. I filter the, the uh, oil, but you can't get everything else. So I'm like, I'm going through 15 pounds of oil a week, which is like 150 bucks. I'm selling onion rings for eight. So I was like, you got to sell, I got to sell like, 40 orders of onion rings to make any money on it um each week so we axe the onion rings they're just seasonal now uh, we haven't picked what season they're going to be in <laughs> uh, but it'll be most likely when the oil's getting towards the end when we know because i can get about two to three weeks out of the oil out, out of the uh tallow um without that with the onion rings i got like maybe a whole day max yeah. Um, so we axed that for a bit and we kind of focused it on uh, the burgers and fries. We, but we do do this thing called loaded freedom fries, hmm. which is a deconstructed burger on top of fries with all the toppings. It's excellent. It's it like your uh, animal style. Yes. Yeah yeah. 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 This is in the Orlando area usually? It's in Winter Park at forward slash the oh, okay. Blending yeah, House gotcha. Distillery. Yeah. yeah. In Winter Park. Yeah. That's great, cool. great spot. Yeah. We, yeah. we still haven't been to forward slash, but we've had their bourbon and tequila we actually did an event with them for base of cigars at cigars on the app it was base of cigars and uh forward slash one of their bourbons and their tequila and it's pretty good stuff yeah yeah they do a great job and i I said that their their owners mike and tim uh i worked with them on a bourbon that we made with them and um so it's just kind of natural. It was fun. And it's a half a mile down the street from my house. So it was like a really yeah. cool excuse to hang out yeah. on Sundays. And, and it was fun. It gave me something to, you know, to stay motivated and, and figure out, you know, what I was doing and stay focused on things. And as these things have started to grow, I said that was one thing. It worked like the shoulders of giants thing worked. That worked. People are like, you should do more days at the snack shack. And I'm like, I don't, I can't. Like yeah. if I did three or four days, it would take away from the other things I'm doing. And then also people are like, well, you know, you could do more. I'm like, what are you crazy? And like the restaurant business is brutal. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah. you think I want to do this every day of the week? I go, it's fun on Sundays. And if somebody wants to do a, you know, a high end catering thing, I can do that for them too. Yeah. Um, so those things are enjoyable, but yeah, doing like a burger restaurant four days a week out in the sun is not yeah. uh, my concept of, of how I wanted my yeah. career to go. Cause now you're competing too. Like if you have it just on Sundays, it's like, okay, we'll go there Sunday for sure. If you yeah. have it like you know even half the week it's like okay well, well you got to build a customer base yeah. right and it's, you got to yeah. make it work on sundays it's like you know who shows up shows up if it's big it's big if it's small it's small either way it's fine you, you just the losing's low 
So if it's a loss of a day, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. If it's a win, it's a big deal. Uh, but you know, if you're doing four days a week, seven days a week, it's your full time gig. I mean, there's times where it's just you know tough. Yeah, tough. So quick question: When you were at UCF, where was your go to pizza place? Uh, we we had a couple of Fratello's was probably the one we ordered the most from. Wrong answer. Yeah, well, well <laughs> that's what we ordered because it was easy and quick. If we wanted good pizza, we'd go to Goodfellas. Wrong answer. Yeah, mm. what's the right answer? They, you well, some of the places that you might mention might not have existed then. You yeah, know, this was twenty years ago. My, uh, my family owned uh, Giovanni's Italian Restaurant. Oh, Giovanni's was freaking great, dude. Yeah, we went yeah. there a lot too. Yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. know. Uh, yeah, we went there a lot. That yeah, was awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Geos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was excellent stuff. So we, we had four locations. We just sold them all. Really, so, congratulations! Yeah. yeah, we uh no, we did Geo's a lot. I got a, a Giovanni's uh my my mini fridge from college is still alive, and my dad uses it up home, and it has a Giovanni's magnet on it. <laughs> no, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. That thing's an antique. Yeah, yeah Giovanni's was excellent. Um, that was kind of like higher end for us. Yeah, so it was yeah, like, yeah. oh, we're gonna order Geo's tonight. Fratello's was just cheap, quick, easy. It was it was not great pizza. Yeah, yeah. Goodfellas was good. Giovanni's was was excellent. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I, I, like you I'm go glad on, you, you mentioned that. Take, take it, take out a girl, or uh-huh. you know, you're going to spend some money. Yeah, yeah, it was excellent. Yeah, we ordered from there quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how long has that video location been there? Twenty six years. It started in uh, 1995. Okay, yeah, so about tw- uh, a little longer, 28, something yeah, like that. Yeah, it started like almost the day after I was born, pretty much. Okay, yeah. yeah. He was born and like, what should we do now that we just <laughs> re- let- <laughs> we just had a kid and ruin our life? Let's let's open up a <laughs> restaurant. Yeah, let's make it worse. really screw ourselves. But I was like, yeah, I just want to get out of the house all day, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's cool, man. Yeah, no, we, yeah. Ate, we ate that quite a bit. I'm trying to think if there's there was pretty much those and then Lazy Moon came along. Yeah, yeah. I like Lazy Moon, but it's it's just it's too ridiculous for me. They, so Lazy Moon was there when you were in college? It opened yeah. Yeah, yeah. they had okay. a big L shaped plaza. Uh-huh. That's I didn't realize now. they were that old. Yeah. There yeah. was uh the there was um there was a bar in that same complex called the library. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice li- library. We know. Yeah. And then uh was the, Mad Hatter's around? <sighs> I think so, but I, I I was only really over there a year, and okay, then I yeah. did come over a little bit more as my buddy Jeremy stayed on that uh, stayed on that side of town, so I'd come over and hang out over there often. And I still had some classes, but towards the end of my sophomore year, I was into pretty much all no general ed, no gen ed classes anymore. So I was pretty much for two and a half years exclusively on this side of town. I didn't really have to go over for much of anything. Yeah. Um, and then I don't know. I don't know what I ordered for pizza when I was living in Metro West. I really don't even remember most of that stuff. Um, what type of pizza do you order? Me, I'm I'm a big pepperoni guy. Okay, yeah, yeah. me too. Correct answer. Yeah. Correct answer. I'm like I'm like a two toppings max. Yeah, thin crust, thin crust is my way to go. My favorite pizzas right now in the area are uh, Mister O One and um, Ziggy's. Hmm. Nice. Okay. I haven't been to either of those places. Those are Winter Park local. Have you? Mr. No. One's here in uh, here in Lake Mary. Yeah, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're right where uh, Peach Valley is. Yeah, Zach. Has oh, been there. I still haven't been there. Yeah, yeah, yeah they yeah. Uh, they 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 got like two more locations coming. They're based out of Miami. Okay, and um, we'll put them on the map. They got like a nine two from one bite. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the only thing I don't like about them is they had a thousand five star reviews before they opened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How'd that happen? That's my, that's my only nickpick. They, they have a huge <laughs> following in Miami. It's like one of the best spots. To, like it's kind of like a cult following. So they probably got all those reviews. They uh, they probably uh, harvested those from Miami. But that's very possible. Yeah, those are the ones that I eat the most of around here. The the uh, the Ziggy's one is right near me in like the Ivanhoe Village, and it's super thin crust. It's very yeah. similar to Mister O One. It's okay since they sold the restaurant. You don't have to go to Giovanni's anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was. I was going to have to not be as transparent. <laughs> it was like, we actively, well, the sale hasn't finally gone. Oh, Giovanni's is great. <laughs> no, it is good. Yeah, right. There just one yeah. isn't, there isn't a Giovanni's over where I'm at. No, there's not, no. Yeah. There used to be a long time ago, though, right? Winter Park, you had one? Long, long time, long ago. time ago. Yeah, then they sold it, and then the guy that bought it, he was supposed to change the name, and he never changed the name. So, you know, there's this whole thing going on. So he just took out one letter of the name. But then he couldn't finish painting the note on it, so we took it back over. But by then, it's already, you know, the name's already kind of, yeah. over that area is kind of ruined on it. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. like, uh, you know, Corona was the Davidoff location, right? And then Davidoff was like, we're going to take our name out of there. 
Yeah. It's still, cor- it, it, it always was Corona. It still is Corona. Like it didn't really have an impact I, I on it. I always called it Corona. Yeah. yeah. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. It was just hard not it was to. It Corona Tampa. Yeah. And, and it was, the staff was like the same, you know, it was the same people. The yeah. Same I mean, they wore the shirts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was, it was always, you know, Corona, Corona is unique in that it is, it's a big brand in itself and it's bigger in retail than anybody else's retail brand. So like it's bigger than Davidoff's retail stores. It's just yeah. a bigger retail brand. So it's, it, you would even, you could make that call at Davidoff as much as you want, but it was being operated by Corona. So that was a bigger brand. Yeah. But um, too, like Davidoff, when you think of Davidoff, it's the, the brand, it's the product brand. You don't, you know, you think of the locations as second. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, they have Davidoff lounges, but that's not your first thought. You usually just think of the cigar. Whereas Corona, it's the retail. Well, it's like Disney World. You have different parks in Disney World, right? So Corona is Disney World, and then part of their part, one of their parks was Davidoff by Corona Cigars, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so it's still Corona. Yeah. Um, did they always serve Cuban sandwiches when they opened up? Like, when, when did that stop? Do you remember? They probably stopped like, sheesh. It was probably 13, 14 years ago. So what ended up happening was. Like 2011? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It might, it might have gone through 2012. Mm. It might have ended before that. I don't know fully, but it's definitely over 10 years, uh, over 15 to, I would say close. But they, what happened was they. <clears throat> so you, you had food service, right? So it was considered food service at first, but it was already pre-made. All they did is heat, they pre-made from, they heated them up on presses. And you get a, a bag of plantain chips with it, and they'd serve it in a cigar box. And then it became one of the regulations changed, and they had to have certified food handlers on site at the same time. And then you had to have different kitchen setups, even if you were just prepping food that was already prepackaged mm-hmm. uh, for you. So instead of instead of trying to find a food handler to be on site all the time, it was just too much of a hassle. And it wasn't, you know. They weren't selling, they were selling a good amount of sandwiches, you know, because it was a fun thing to do, but it was, it wasn't, you wouldn't walk in there and see like a yeah. hundred people secondary. eating Cuban sandwiches, just like, yeah. oh, hey, let's go get a Cuban at Corona and have a cigar and some Cuban coffee. Uh, so it just, it just became a, a more of a headache than it needed to be. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, too, in Florida, the regulations with having food at a cigar lounge is crazy anyway. So why go through the hassle? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But like when we go to, when we go up north, like we were in Michigan. Michigan's um, the best yeah. move for cigar oh, restaurants. Because they're all restaurants. They're cigar restaurants yeah. and, bist- and bistros. Did you guys go to um to Robustos? We we didn't. So we went to um that's next on our list. We went to uh Churchill's mm-hmm. and then there's a newer one, Don Cristos. I don't know if you've been there yet. I haven't been there, but I'm familiar with it. Yeah, yeah, v- yeah beautiful spot. Out great. Yeah. 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 My spot up there is um Churchill's is great. Yeah. Uh there's this guy, Harry, that owns uh, Robusto's. He's been in business about six years now, and he just opened up a second location, and it's uh, called Robusto's Cigar Bar and Bistro. And the guy's a psalm and a chef. I mean, the food he puts out is out of control. Yeah. It's crazy, too. Like, Churchill's and Don Cristo's, the food is actually, like, top tier food it's well, not just like well, churchill's you know, is like go. a steakhouse no yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's churchill's yeah, is a steakhouse yeah. that is a cigar restaurant yeah. it's the craziest thing we did a bachelor party up there once and people were like what are you going up there for the strip clubs and we're like well yes <laughs> 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 but we went up because it was a cigar restaurant every night we were at a different cigar restaurant yeah. and we'd go out and have dinner smoke cigars at the same time hang out and then the guys i was dd during that shock shockingly i wasn't drinking so i I didn't do any uh, any nefarious activities outside of smoking and eating every night. And I'd drop them off and they'd Uber back to the hotel uh, for three nights. Uh, but, yeah, no, it's a great market for mm-hmm. that. But I tell people, I'm like, if you like to eat, drink, and smoke, I'm like, Detroit and Michigan is the best place in the country to go yeah, and have sure. cigar restaurants. It's like a whole different world. Like, that's their normal. It's a restaurant, cigar lounge, bar. Mm-hmm. Down here, it's unheard of, basically. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that should be an everywhere law. You know what I mean? I think it should be, too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's there's spots that have it because the private clubs and different things like that. You know, they can yeah. take that, mar- you know, etch that part of the market out. But yeah, to do it here in Florida because you can smoke in bars. It's just once you have smoking in the bar and food services, then when it becomes a real iffy and yeah. uh, challenging spot, you could probably do it. But if it made sense completely and it wasn't insane, probably somebody would have done it. Yeah. yeah, I always say that. It's like, if it was really viable and could be done, somebody would do it if it was here in Florida. And so since it hasn't happened, um, it makes sense to me that they've made it 
too much of an effort to do it. Have you been to um, the drawing room or at the London house yet? I have not been over there yet. I've heard great things about it, but I've not been over there. Yeah, yeah. that's a private club, technically. Technically, yeah. I think yeah. you'll be fine. So I think your cigars will do the good there too. But yeah, they have the the cigar side. All they have to do really for that is bring the food from next door over mm-hmm. to you know the lounge for you to eat. Um, but yeah, being a cigar rep, I think you could have. You know, you can get in there no problem and at least take a tour and all that. Yeah, I've got some friends over there that are members. Yeah. Um I, I'm I'm a corona loyalist, man. I uh that's where I started smoking. That's it's every it, conveniently we're here, but if we weren't here, I'd still tell the story. Every time people ask how I got a corona is part of my story. Um so it's unavoidable. Yeah, it is. It's just part yeah. of what I do, and it's a great thing for Jeff. He built something incredible, and said it's. I, it's every time I talk about cigars and how I got into it, he's part of the story, and um, it's a great advertising piece. But I, I'm a huge Corona loyalist. I, I uh, if, if they bring in the cigars, which hopefully they do soon, you know that'll be that'll be it for me in Orlando. We'll have cigars on the Avenue, Cigar mm-hmm. Hustler. Blend and Barrel in Sanford. Um, the uh, new one of the new owners over there is a good friend of mine, so we're doing some work with that. And then and then Corona, and that's about it. Is you think about uh, as I said keeping it keeping as as manageable as possible. Uh, I mean, Corona's got five massive stores. Yep. The other spots are all great retailers, and then there's good there's other good retailers in the market. Uh, but why oversaturate it? And um, but I do look forward to going into London House. I would like to go. Uh, I don't know what we'll do cigar wise there. As I said, I'm pretty much a Corona loyalist, but uh, I do want to go and I want to enjoy the place as a, as a customer. Yeah, uh, for sure. I've yeah. heard it's beautiful. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely the closest <clears throat> thing that you can get to like a Michigan style place because you can get food. Um, because they have you know two essentially the London House and the next door they have the cigar lounge, the drawing room. So yeah, it's, it's two separate cool. buildings. So. Yeah. Yeah, outside of that, your best bet's going to be like a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar initiation private club or something. We're not touching that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, even there, I mean, if you want to become a member, I think it's um, minimum fifteen hundred initiation fee, four grand a year. So I mean, yeah, you, the you have to definitely pay for it. Yeah, I'll leverage my you know I'll, I'll leverage my experience in the cigar business over there <laughs> <laughs> if I go. <laughs> If I go. So what do you guys think of the cigars? Yeah. So I'm not saying this just because you're here, but this right now is probably in my top three of favorite Connecticut's. It's That's awesome, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I like I like when people smoke the green first and yeah. then smoke the Connecticut. Because it stand it does stand up to it. So it's not like, hey, I'm I beat my palate up with something yeah. stronger. Yeah. It really gives it a good contrast. And I, I I enjoy the Connecticut a lot. And I also do it like the reverse where I smoked it first and then do the corona. But yeah, the Connecticut's excellent. And I I appreciate it. I felt the same way uh, when I smoked it, and that was part of the reason why why I jumped on it. And I've told I said I've told my partners with it. I said, um, I, "You guys, the green's going to do really well when we do event experiences. You're going to see a spike in that first. I go, but what you're going to see is if it's going to be if you if the if the retailer we're in is committed to it you're going to see a massive spike on the Connecticut yeah I go, because yeah. it's it's going to be an easier an easier sell to people that don't traditionally like darker cigars so you've got a big part of that market then you're going to have people that are interested like us in trying everything in something yeah. and then we're going to be like mm, that's pretty good so then you end up having something like that that smokes both yeah, yeah. um but I said you know you, you're going to see a real focus right off if the retailer is actually getting into people's hands that's going to be what the what they're getting they're getting them so and it, it was in, interesting because i my first reorder last week after a week and a half the first reorder the guy ordered all connecticut's he's like i need two more of each and i was like the green's doing well he's like yeah really well he goes that was what everybody grabbed first he goes then i told him they had to try the connecticut and he goes then that's what they're smoking every day yeah yeah um so i was like good i go that was like what i was hoping would happen and and that was a sign of what you were doing with it so i go thank you and then that was a good thing it was like hey you know that was the right place to be yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think a lot of problems too with a lot of Connecticut's is they don't have a lot of flavor to them. Mm-hmm. Well, I was gonna say, yeah, like everyone at this table I know is not generally a Connecticut guy. Yeah, but when you have a really good Connecticut, it's like, okay, that's awesome. I love that cigar, and that's why I love the cigar. I know you love the cigar, is because it's a Connecticut that stands out in flavor, quality. Everything's really good. Yep. Yep. 
No, it definitely, uh, it's definitely not mild. It's definitely got flavor to it. And uh, it stands up even after smoked something that's got a little bit more aggressive flavor profile. I'm curious to hear yeah. what Jared's favorite has been so far. Oh, the green, for sure. Yeah, I figured. It was like my third green, second one of these. Yeah, Jared is definitely our token full-body dark cigar kind of guy, so I figured that's how it would lean. You know, like yeah. triple Maduro and empty stomach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it, it, that's a big part of the market. That's why I said that's why the green's going to do well when we do experiences, event experiences. People, are, that's going to get them into it first, but um, and the reality is there's more people that smoke Connecticut's than any other cigars out there because a more casual smoker yeah. smokes them. Yeah. There's just, we're around these people. We're around each other a lot. You know, and people like us, so we smoke fuller bodied cigars just naturally because that's what we do. But you figure there's 380 million documented people here in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when the casual smoker that say, say you got a 20 million people that go out and play golf and yeah. one out of five of them will smoke a cigar every once in a while, that's like, a hundred million cigars. Yeah, and that's the key too. Yeah. It's most cigar smokers realistically are casual cigar smokers. They go for yeah. the Connecticut or they have their Cubans and it's yeah. like, you know, a golfing or, you know, fancy events and stuff like that. Realistically, people like us are a much smaller niche mm -hmm. in the market overall. And, and the green will be part of that market and the white will be both. Yeah. You know, a percentage of both. Yeah. So because sure. I typically start with a darker cigar and at the end of that, I actually get a lighter cigar because I don't like leaving with an intense flavor in my mouth. So I'm like the opposite of what yeah, people true. normally do. Yeah. Well, too, when you have a cigar like this, if you know what you're smoking, you can start with a darker cigar. Yeah, for sure. And then finish off with I, what I say sometimes is you finish off with a Connecticut or like a mild Habano. It's refreshing mm -hmm. to leave off at the end of the night. So I got a little pool in the backyard. It's like uh, eight foot long and like six foot wide. It's like three and a half feet, maybe three feet deep. So it's for my daughter, but it's also like a waiting sitting pool. And so my friend of mine gave it to me. He's like, Hey, I got a pool that I want to give you. And I'm like, what do you mean? So he, I go, is it got a filter in it? Or is it? He's like, yeah, yeah. So you, you wanted the chemicals and stuff. I was like, yeah, we'll take it. And like, my daughter will love it. She's three. And, um, I use it every night. So I go out at the end of the night and I have like, I'll take, I won't even smoke necessarily a full cigar. I will, I, I, I don't like doing this because it's not perfect for flavor. So I wouldn't recommend someone who's like, you want to get the best flavor out of something, don't leave a cigar overnight. If you're just doing it for the, 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 the motion of, yeah. of having a cigar, I'll like, I don't want to go outside for an hour at night, but I do go out for like a half, you know, 20 minutes, half hour, and I'll grab like a Connecticut or the green Corona, smoke half of it, hang out in the pool, and then set it off to the side and then grab it in the morning when I dip in the morning too. Yeah. Um, and it is, it's like a refresher. You don't have like, you know, what is it? Salt pool or chlorine pool or it's chlorine? You have a, you know, weird uh, flavor built in there after a day. <laughs> well, I try. <laughs> if it enhances the chlorine, enhances the cigar smoke. <laughs> if you're doing it right, the chlorine level shouldn't be too high where you have to smell it. So I test it every day. One thing that I did do, though, um, I was gone for three days, a week and a half ago. And my wife forgot to turn the filter on. So I came back and it was like green. Yeah. So I had to shock it. Man, it took like nine days for that chlorine to work out of that thing because I put in too much um, because it was so concentrated. So I tested every day. I was killing my daughter. She's like, Daddy, can we go in the pool? And I'm like, no, <laughs> it's going to disintegrate you. Um, so about four days ago, it was finally ready to go. It cleared it up. The next day, it was not green any longer. Because So if you ever use one of the little chlorine test strips, it's like green. So like a dark green is like the highest level. So the, the total chlorine is like a gauge of green. I put it in and it turned black Ooh. <laughs> instantly. And I'm like, that is not safe. So what I did do is I needed to, uh, I needed to clean some like, uh, my running sneakers because they'd been, they'd been, wow. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, I threw two pairs of sneakers in the pool and floated them around. I'm like, that'll be perfect. They'll That's soak in the chlorine. You sure my, you didn't throw those in before? I thought it got dirty. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so my wife's like, why are there sneakers floating in the pool? She's like, I thought we were trying to get the chemicals down. I was like, I am. I go, but in the process, I'm using it as like bleach. Yeah. You yeah, know? And, uh, and Everything just happens for a stone. reason. You need to clean your shoes. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I could have just used the washer, but I was like, why nah. miss this opportunity of high chlorine levels? Hmm. Yeah. Everything happens for a reason. You got to you gotta use your quote unquote bad things that happen to make something good.
And two, like realistically, you wouldn't have washed your shoes anyway. So I think that's a, you know exactly, <laughs> exactly. That was the main purpose. So it was like I needed to, I needed to be able to have the shoes back in the house again. And to do that, they needed to be in that type of environment uh, to find it acceptable. So, but yeah, it was a cool little pool. But that, it, you're right on the ref- like it is kind of refreshing, and uh, and it's uh, the sizes on it too. I just like the robusto and the the Corona is great and. Uh, there's so many pr- times that it makes sense for me to have something like that. Especially too, I think, you know, if you're on the go a lot, it makes sense to have a smaller size too, because you you never know if you got only like 45 minutes or an hour, mm-hmm. you can finish it no problem and not feel bad. Yep. Yeah. hundred percent. And then, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with one of the reasons why we'd always smoke smaller cigars on the road when, when I was visiting five or six stops a day with, with, uh, one of our sales reps, um, when you're done smoking the cigar, the conversation's done. Yeah. You know, it's an excuse to leave. Oh, you know, my cigar's done. So we'd smoke smaller sizes too. Cause you know, we're going to go in 30, 40 minutes. We don't want to, you know, we have other places to go. So we're not going to sit there for an hour or two. So you grab a smaller cigar. You want to enjoy it with somebody and, and you, you know, you were done or you had a little bit left. Well, we're going to get going. You finish the cigar out and then yeah. you do the same thing at the next stop. Yeah. No one wants a rep showing up with a eight by 80. <laughs> it's like we're gonna, we're gonna deal with this guy for three hours. <laughs> hey, we're gonna sit down and have a cigar together, and it's it's ten inches long <laughs> by a hundred sixty fourths of an inch. Uh, yeah, so I've done that before with bigger cigars, but you know, it's usually at the end of the night for hanging out or whatever, and yeah. just for fun. But you know, you're not you're you're not gonna be smoking four or five of those things a day. No, it it's like the last well, stop. You know? No, people do. Just, I'm have. not driving around in a car doing it. For, it's not, sounds like a work. challenge. Right yeah, yeah. yeah. We've we been talking for a while about uh, us buying the Woody and then like filming me smoke it all in one day, one sitting. Have you ever smoked the April Fools by uh, uh, Asylum? I'm not. not yet. He, so we've done the eight by eighties that yeah. they had the ogres and stuff, but. Yeah. I've no, smoked three yet. of the April Fools. They're really good. It's just massive. Yeah. Um, well, I will say, like, they make th- those big cigars actually are great. They taste great. They smoke great. But yeah, I mean, you got to be able to sit there for two to three, four hours. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, the first one I smoked was we were at the TAA in, uh, Dominican Republic. And I went over to Tom Lazuka, the owner of Asylum and his, uh, the other owner, uh, Christian Roa. And I was like, Hey, you guys got one of those April fools. I want to smoke them. He's like, yeah, kid, I'll give you one. He's like, you know what? I'll smoke one with you. And I was like, okay. And, uh, <laughs> you know what you're getting into? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, he goes, I've, I've never smoked one. I want to smoke. I'm like, all right, cool. Let's, let's do it together. So we lit it up. The Christian lasted like 10 minutes <laughs> and he's like, I'm not doing this. He's like, this is insane. I go, yeah, it's Asylum. And, um, I smoked it for six and a half hours. Dang. Uh-huh. Damn. I was out of control. So that's about the nine by 90. Uh huh. Yeah. And everybody yeah. was like, how is it? And I said, it's really good tobacco. I go, it's really good. I go, but like, it's exhausting. Did you finish? Yeah. Yeah. I got down to like an inch. In and, six um, hours. I hope yeah. so. <laughs> and, uh, it was just a lot to handle because you had like, it, it's like holding this microphone yeah. in your hand for, for six hours. You run, you're going to run into it. Uh, you, you knocked it into things. You know, you had to hold your hand. To hold it like a regular, you had to be like this. So it was just, a, it was a hassle. Um, you know, you put in work, but it was very good. I did enjoy it. It was an excellent yeah. cigar and it was definitely fun. And I, it was good to the point where I've smoked two more. So yeah, a lot of times you grab like a, a cigar that big, you can kind of expect this to not be too good just because of how large it is. Well, some but of the, they do a great job. Well, it was gimmicky back in the day. And I'm not saying April Fools isn't a gimmicky thing, but the product's not gimmicky. Yeah. Like it's a good quality product. Uh, the size and the concept was what was kind of gimmicky, but it's, it's gimmicks don't really work as well in the business anymore because it's a, that cigar is like $60, $70. Mm-hmm. It, it better be really good. Right. And yeah, it, it is. Yeah. And it is. And they did a great job of it. And that's, so that's why I smoked, I've smoked other ones. Cause, uh, I was like, okay, it's time for me to beat myself down. Let's smoke this thing and get made fun of for the next five hours. And, <laughs> and it, but in the process, you enjoyed something nice and it was fun. And, Everybody laughed. Yeah. If you have friends there, they're taking pictures of you deep throating a cigar. And- yeah. Well, I didn't do that to it. But <laughs> I mean, my mouth, your mouth has, the, the other thing is I ended up chewing it. Yeah. Cause yeah, you had to flatten it. Yeah. Yeah. Smaller. Cause if you're, if you don't, if you don't flatten it, every time you take a puff, your mouth's partially open. So you don't really get any draw from it. Yeah. So I quickly in the first like 20 minutes chewed it down a little bit. So it was like a flat edge on it. It was a lot easier to smoke. Yeah. All right. I think we're finishing up here. Yeah. All the cigars finishing up just on time. 
again, great cigars. I really enjoy the Bentley's cigars. They're fantastic. I appreciate you for coming on and hanging out with us. It's been great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'd love to come back. I uh, I live close by. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'll talk about any cigars. We can always talk about Bentley, but if you just want somebody to come in and talk about the business, I'm here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Nice, to have, nice to have a good operation close by. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk after you leave and, you know, <gasps> Make sure we can all vote on it, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, maybe, yeah. yeah. I, know, <laughs> I know where y'all live now, so uh, I'll, oh, be out the, uh, I'll be out here at the garage. Hey, guys, can you show up every guys, Wednesday you know, at six o'clock? You need, That's you, fine. You need so, a guest? Well, look, t- to be fair, there's four of us usually, and uh, you know, one of us had to. Uh, they're getting ready to go up to North Carolina, so it worked out fine. Um, but yeah, so no, I mean, def- you're definitely welcome back. We'll definitely have some more conversations in the future. Um, North Carolina's got some cool places to smoke too, man. They uh, <clears throat> there's a restaurant up in Raleigh called the Angus Barn, and they have a place called the Meat Locker, which is an outdoor, partially outdoor, partially indoor smoking area in the back of the restaurant. The place is huge. Um, the Meat Locker. There you go. Because we, we're yeah, going right up there. there. We're going up there this weekend. Well, we have a wedding, so he's leaving now. We're gonna go up there Friday. Yeah, is so. it the Raleigh area? No, no. We're gonna be in the mountains. We're like in uh, Sapphire. Okay. Eh, we how, can take a. How far are you gonna be from like Asheville? It's. I think within an hour of Asheville. Yeah. Hey, there's a uh, there's a nice cigar bar right in downtown Nashville, right across from the Grand Bohemian and the uh, Biltmore, uh, called Casablanca. Okay, uh, which is well, you can't you can't smoke and eat there. But if you do, are you flying into Raleigh? No, we're just gonna drive. Oh, you're driving. Yeah. Uh, if you do go to Raleigh, it's a little a little bit out of the way. But if you do go, check the Angus Barn out. It's a great spot. And a good friend of mine, uh, has got a shop up there called. Um, Hansteads, which is a great spot okay. too. So yeah, Raleigh's a cool spot. Yeah, I think on the way back for sure, <coughs> uh, we might stop somewhere Sunday. So yeah, Angus Barn. It's it's east, so okay. it might be out of the way. I like driving um, ninety five anyway, so mm-hmm. maybe it'll give us yeah. an excuse to. And Raleigh's a great spot. Angus Barn's awesome. Nothing like it. Yeah, you you'll pull up and you're gonna be like, well, this was a cool recommendation. Just okay. for when you, they walk you through the kitchen to get to the meat locker. Oh, that's uh, cool. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, we'll yeah. definitely check that out. Again, thank you for coming on. Check out Bentley Cigars. This is going to be a, a great brand that we're going to obviously see grow into something fantastic. Thank so, you. Yeah, no, yeah. I appreciate the time. And um, it's nice to to talk about what we're doing. And um, for us, it's not just talk. I mean, that's what the brand's going to be built on and how, how we're doing it going forward. So it's, uh, you know, very driven by, by transparency and very much driven by uh, supporting the retailers that we're in. So, if you're a retailer watching it, we're we're gonna we, you know we're gonna stand behind that. And if you're a consumer, you know that the places they're in have been uh, have been vetted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Good deal. All right, thank you guys for tuning in. We'll see you next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Cigar Guys podcast. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you can stay up to date with all the latest episodes. Looking for short form content? Check out all our social media accounts in the description below. So you know what's funny? How old are you guys? The 25, uh, what, wait, 29. 29. Right, the reason 32. I'm asking is not because I'm 40. That's not the reason I'm asking. <clears throat> You're 40? Yeah. No, I, I thought you were like 33. So the reason I'm asking is because, so the Ashton in the in the blue packaging, or the Connecticut, okay? So this is probably like eight, nine years ago. Maybe. That's when that came out. Yeah. Okay. So before that, it was the Ashton Classic, just like that, in the white packaging. So just said Ashton, Cigarillos, whatever. They had the names, uh, different names on it. So it comes out, and I'm in a shop, and it shows up. I'm like, what the fuck is that? And they're like, oh, it's the Ashton, it's the Ashton, new Ashton, Connecticut, Cigarillos. I said, I go, what were the other ones? He goes, Connecticut, I think. And I go, what do you, so I go, do they, do they get rid of the other ones? There's a new package. He's like, no, because it's just the other one. So he calls up the rep. He's like, so what's the difference between those and these? He's like, oh, those are Cameroon. He goes, and those are Connecticut. And he's like, have they always been Cameroon? He's like, yeah. And everyone that smoked <laughs> them, like, thought they were just like the Connecticut, the Connecticut ones. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know what's going on with it, but at this point in time, I don't pay as so I don't pay as much attention to it. But it was hilarious because when it came out, it was like I'm like, what, what do you mean Ashton, Connecticut? They changed the packaging. He's like, yeah, no, they still now I know. At least when we look at it, that box says Connecticut. The white one says Cameroon. It used to uh, not, right? Yeah, it used to not say Cameroon. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. So it all came out. And I'm, literally every shop I'm going into, this was for <laughs> like 
three weeks. I'm like, what? I go, I go, do you know what this is? They're like, yeah, it's New Connecticut. And like maybe yeah. 20% <laughs> of the people that brought it in knew that the other one was previously Cameroon. Yeah, yeah. It'd be funny if it was actually, oh, it's Connecticut. And I just did uh, like a switcheroo, you know? Hey, <laughs> you never know. With you, it might be. Yeah. They had the Ashton Heritage, which used, to, which used to be Cameroon, and they switched it over to Habano because they just couldn't keep up with that as a middle priming. Yeah, yeah. And, um, I just, they couldn't keep up with it. It's just too stupid expensive to do what they were doing. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, so they just switched it and didn't tell anybody. Nobody knew the difference. 